My name's Ethan Powell, and this happened to me in August of 2016. I've been with the NPS for almost a decade by then. Started in Yosemite, ended up here in Yellowstone National Park. Place has its own kind of magic and its own kind of demons, both human and otherwise. Guess some folks drawn to the wilderness are just a different breed. My regular beat was the southeast corner of the park. Backcountry territory, rugged mountains, dense stands of lodgepole pine, and the occasional hidden valley that probably hadn't seen a human footprint in a century. Just the way I like it. Peaceful. Until the day it wasn't. Radio call came crackling in around mid-afternoon. Dispatch for laying a panic 911 from a group of hikers who stumbled onto something awful. I was closest for a response, so I hauled gear into my truck and hit the trailhead. These hikers were seasoned outdoors types, the responsible sort who filed detailed trip plans, which made their distress all the more chilling. They were off the beaten path, about a two-mile hike in, when they rounded a bend and came face to face with a gutted deer carcass hanging from a tree. Not a clean kill, the thing had been torn apart, half-eaten, with blood smeared across the ground and up the bark. Whatever did this, it was strong and sloppy, which didn't bode well. A messy predator is a desperate one, and a desperate predator is dangerous. I reached the site as the sun dipped below the mountains. Long shadows stretched across the forest floor, making my heart thud faster. The carcass was gone. I found the tree easily enough, blood still tacky on the rough bark, and something else, a single, deep gouge in the wood. Whatever made that wasn't using teeth. I radioed for backup, the words tight in my throat. Rangers weren't supposed to patrol alone after dark, protocol drummed into us since the academy. But I wasn't leaving those hikers out here, not with dusk approaching and that knowing sense of unease prickling at my skin. We found them huddled together in a small clearing, jumpy as rabbits. I couldn't blame them. I told them to stay put while I searched the surrounding area. There's an art to tracking in the fading light more feel than sight. I scanned for prints, broken branches, any disturbance, all the while suppressing that primal urge to glance over my shoulder. Took almost an hour, and what I found chilled me deeper than the mountain air. Footprints, not from any animal I recognized. The creature was bipedal, but the print was elongated, toes splayed like claws. Too heavy to be human, unless we were dealing with a giant out of some nightmare. My gut twisted. We weren't alone in these woods. Just when I thought we might get lucky and the thing had moved on, I heard it, a rustling from the trees on the slope above us. Then, a guttural snarl that raised the hair on my neck. I yelled at the hikers to run, even as I fumbled for my rifle. Out of the shadows it burst. A blur of darkness at first, then resolving into a form that still makes my skin crawl when I think back on it. Too tall, limbs too long, and thin, starvingly thin. The skin stretched taut over bones, giving it a skeletal look. But it was the head that lodged in my memory like a shard of ice, all skull and gaping maw, eyes like twin pits of pure, hungry darkness. I fired a warning shot, more out of desperation than strategy. The creature flinched, hissed, then lunged at one of the hikers, a woman named Sarah. She screamed. I got another shot off, hitting it square in the shoulder. Blood, black and oozing, splattered the ground, but the creature didn't go down. It wasn't enough. It snatched Sarah as easy as plucking a flower. I heard her cries echo through the trees as the creature bolted up the slope with impossible speed. My heart hammered a frantic beat. Failure clawed at my throat. I had to go after her, 
but the fading light and the sheer monstrousness of what I'd just seen gave me pause. One wrong move, and I'd end up just like Sarah. I radioed for backup again, my voice shaking. Told them everything, the creature, the attack, the impossible nature of it all. The response was the same tired skepticism I was used to by now. Reinforcements were inbound, but it'd be hours till they arrived. Sarah wouldn't have hours. I knew that deep down. Protocol be damned. I wasn't about to become another tally mark on whatever this creature's kill list was. Following the trail under starlight was slow, agonizing work. The creature's footprints were easy enough to spot where the ground was soft, but it seemed to vanish into thin air on rocky stretches. The blood trail helped, stark against the gray stone, but it was erratic. Was the creature injured, or toying with me? Then, almost too faint to catch, came Sarah's voice. A whimper cut off short. I broke into a run, heart pounding in my ears. Up ahead, the trees thinned, moonlight spilling onto a rocky outcropping. And there it was. Sarah lay sprawled on the ground, barely breathing, her clothing shredded. The creature crouched over her, its skull-like face tilted as if in contemplation, the moonlight glinting off its claws. I raised my rifle, hands trembling. I couldn't miss, not from this range. My finger tightened on the trigger. An easy shot, a clean kill. My training took over, breath steadying, all those countless rounds fired at the range coalescing into this single, stark moment. Then the creature shifted, head snapping up, those pit-black eyes locking onto mine from across the clearing. My blood ran cold. It knew. Not just that I was there, but what I intended. A flicker of something like malice crossed its monstrous face. Then it snarled, dropped Sarah like a discarded rag doll, and bolted into the trees. I sprinted to Sarah's side, rifle forgotten. She was barely alive, gashes crisscrossing her torso, blood soaking the ground beneath her. Her eyes fluttered open and met mine, filled with a desperate plea. Help! She choked out, a single, rag syllable choked with blood. Then her eyes rolled back, and her body went limp. My stomach heaved, a scream building in my chest but finding no release. It was too late. Too late for Sarah, for whatever shred of normalcy I'd clung to, for everything. The backup team arrived by daybreak, somber and armed to the teeth. They didn't fully believe me, not until they saw Sarah's mangled body and the creature's inhuman footprints stamped into the earth. Then the doubt in their eyes shifted into something colder, harder. There was a sweep of the area, meticulous and thorough. No sign of the creature, no hidden lair or den, nothing to suggest it hadn't simply vanished back into the wilderness from which it came. The official incident report concluded a freak bear attack, the atypical injuries attributed to post-mortem scavenging by other wildlife. They scrubbed my statement clean, erasing any mention of the creature's true, horrific form. Sarah's family got a sanitized story, one easier to bear than the monstrous truth. I went on mandatory leave, the nightmares and the echoing silence of that clearing my constant companions. When I returned to duty, I was reassigned. New park, new scenery, same old bureaucratic nightmare. Nobody wanted to hear my truth, least of all my fellow rangers. When I mentioned the creature, even in veiled terms, I got pitying looks or outright hostility. The message was clear, shut up follow protocol, and maybe, just maybe, you won't end up another wilderness statistic. For a while, I tried to obey, to bury that night deep down and pretend it never happened. The creature, out there in the wilds, became my own personal boogeyman, 
haunting my patrols while the rest of the world went along their merry way, blissfully unaware. Then, the reports started trickling in. Sightings from other national parks, whispers of similar attacks, missing hikers turning up mangled, if they turned up at all. Always the same pattern, creature descriptions matching my own to a horrifying degree, and incidents explained away as animal attacks or freak accidents. Other rangers, I realized, were seeing it too, scattered and isolated, their voices systemically silenced. There was a ranger in the Great Smokies, Jackson, who met my eyes at a national conference with a flicker of shared madness. He found me later, away from the crowds, and told me his story, eerily similar to mine, down to the detail of the creature's glowing eyes. We talked into the night, swapping every scrap of information we had, drawing maps in the dust of remote canyons and backcountry trails where these attacks clustered. A pattern emerged, not just geographic, but temporal. The creature seemed to strike in cycles, years of silence punctuated by bursts of intense, localized violence. Jackson had a wild theory about hibernation, some primal instinct driving it to gorge, then vanish for long stretches. But why some years and not others? We had more questions than answers. One thing became painfully obvious. The official response would always be suppression and denial. If we wanted justice for Sarah, for all the others claimed by this nameless horror, we had to take matters into our own hands. We formed a loose network, those few rangers who had witnessed the creature's brutality, and whose souls burned with a cold fury the higher-ups could never understand. We started small. Sharing information quietly, stockpiling supplies, slipping away from our patrols whenever we could to scour those high, lonesome places for any sign of the creature. There were false leads, dead ends, whispers that turned to ashes the moment we grasped at them. And always, the creature loomed over our efforts, a monstrous shadow we could never seem to catch. Two years back, I got word of an attack in Yosemite, my old stomping ground. Classic pattern, hiker found half-eaten, blamed on a rogue bear despite the bizarre injuries. I requested a transfer immediately. My superiors grumbled, called it impulsive, but after my history, they didn't try to stop me. I packed my truck and headed back to California, not just to hunt, but to settle a score. Months of fruitless searching followed. I slept in my truck, lived off trail rations, grew gaunt and weathered like the mountains around me. The wilderness, once my sanctuary, become a vast, empty trap. Just when my determination nearly gave way, I stumbled across a recent kill, a doe, ravaged in that same gruesome way I knew too well. Blood was fresh. The creature was close. I've been tracking it for days now, following the subtle signs only a seasoned ranger, fueled by obsession, might notice. I feel it, a prickling at the back of my neck that's more than animal instinct. The creature knows I'm here, knows I'm different from the hapless tourists and casual hikers it usually preys upon. Tonight I'll make camp at the base of a cliff face pockmarked with small caves. One of those might be its den. Tomorrow, as the light fades, I'll ascend. The rifle feels heavy in my hands, but I've brought other tools as well, silver bullets, forged under a hunter's moon, and a white-hot rage that has been kindling in my gut since the day I saw Sarah die. I won't go down without a fight. I won't become another convenient cover story, another name scrubbed from the records. Maybe I'll die up there on that lonely cliff face, the creature tearing me apart just like all the others. But maybe, just maybe, I'll land a fatal shot and drag its monstrous corpse out of the shadows. If the world doesn't want to acknowledge monsters, I'll give them one they can't ignore.
The Grand Canyon in 1976. That's where it began. Call me Silas, Silas Ward. Back then, I was young, a geology major obsessed with the layers of history written into those rocks. Had this idea of ditching the tourist-clogged trails, spending a few weeks really exploring off the beaten path. It should have been a dream come true, if I hadn't been so damned naive. I set out from Bright Angel Trailhead with a pack full of supplies, a map, and a youthful sense of invincibility. First day went like clockwork, and by nightfall, I'd found a secluded overhang perfect for camp. The quiet way out there, it was something special. Stars brighter than I'd ever seen in the city, silence so thick you could almost reach out and touch it. Almost. That's when the noises started. At first, I chalked it up to an overactive imagination. Rustling leaves, snaps of twigs, the kind of stuff that's easy to explain away, alone in the dark. Problem was, they were getting closer. I wasn't tracking some skittish deer. This was big, and it was circling me. I tossed a few rocks towards the sound, hoping to scare whatever it was off. Got a glimpse of movement, a flash of eyes reflecting the firelight. It was upright bipedal, but lanky in a way that didn't seem natural. Almost insectal with its long limbs. Then it was gone. Sleep was impossible. Every rustle of the wind had me grabbing my flashlight, heart pounding. By dawn, I felt more hunted than hiker. I wanted to radio for help, but what could I even say? That the boogeyman was after me? Besides, my pride was as stubborn as the canyon walls. I'd see this through, even if it killed me. Day two was torture. Every crevice in the rock... Every shadowy alcove, they all seemed to hold a pair of glinting eyes. I found a handprint pressed into the soft earth near a watering hole. It was way too big for a human, and the fingers were all wrong, elongated, with an extra joint. That's when the certainty kicked in. This wasn't delusion, wasn't some animal. It was tracking me, toying with me, I was sure of it. The question burned in my mind, why? Was I prey? Had I wandered into something's territory? Whatever the reason, I knew staying put wasn't an option. I had to get somewhere defensible, somewhere with a clear escape route. That afternoon, I reached Hermit's Rest. It's one of those lookouts on the south rim, always swarming with tourists. Safety in numbers, I figured. The creature wouldn't risk showing itself with so many witnesses, would it? That hope kept me pushing through exhaustion. I even started humming a stupid old tune under my breath, trying to ward off the rising panic. It was just past sunset when I staggered onto the paved trail. Breathless, disheveled, and probably looking half-crazed, I expected a curious crowd at the viewpoint. What I found was emptiness. Not a single car in the lot, not a single person on the trail. That eerie sense of stillness settled over me, worse than the nights alone. And then I saw it, the reason for the deserted trailhead. A park ranger lay crumpled at the edge of the lookout. Blood soaked his uniform, his eyes stared blankly at the sky. His throat had been ripped open, the wounds ragged and brutal. Nausea washed over me, then a surge of adrenaline. I wasn't dealing with some big cat or reclusive weirdo. This was a predator, and a ruthless one. Turning to run felt like admitting defeat, but I knew it was the only chance. And then I heard it, the sound of clicking footsteps echoing on the stone behind me. I spun, raising my flashlight. There it was, less than twenty feet away. Taller than any man, hunched over with its impossibly long arms nearly scraping the ground. Its skin was leathery, stretched taut over protruding bones. Its face, its face was like a skull, 
with jagged teeth and eyes like bottomless pits. The image burned itself into my brain. It hissed, a dry, rattling sound that sent shivers down my spine. Then it moved blurringly fast. I stumbled backwards, tripping over my own feet. The flashlight went flying, and I was plunged into darkness. I scrambled, reaching blindly for anything that could serve as a weapon, a rock, a fallen branch. My fingers brushed against something cold and smooth. The ranger's discarded pistol. I fumbled with it, heart pounding, knowing it was my only shot. Click, 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 the sound of the creature closing and pierced the night. A flicker of movement, a flash of those terrible eyes. I squeezed the trigger. The gunshot split the air, a deafening thunderclap in the unnatural silence. For a heart-stopping moment, nothing happened. Then, a guttural shriek pierced my ears, a sound of rage and pain combined. Something heavy slammed into the ground next to me. Panic fueled my movements as I scrambled to my feet and ran blindly guided only by the echoes of that monstrous cry fading behind me. I didn't stop until my lungs burned and my legs gave out, collapsing in a panting heap at the base of a juniper tree. Dawn found me bruised, battered, and utterly broken. The gun was long gone, lost in my panicked flight. I should have felt relief, triumph even. But as I stumbled back towards Hermit's Rest, Despair not at me. Even if I got out, got help, who would believe me? The carnage was just as I'd left it. The ranger's body, that horrific creature nowhere in sight. And then I saw it, the detail that chilled me to the bone, three deep, clawed gouges freshly etched into the stone railing. It had been there, watching me. I reported the ranger's death, but the creature... The official story was a mountain lion attack, and I was too traumatized to argue. In the hospital, hooked up to IVs and monitors, I gave a statement riddled with vague language, animal attack, unknown type, the standard cover-up. That part of me, that adventurous, idealistic kid, died that day. The nightmares didn't stop. For years I woke with that rasping hiss in my ears, the gleam of those inhuman eyes branded on my eyelids. Therapists tried, friends offered comfort, but the wound festered. I abandoned geology, the canyons forever tainted. Instead, I threw myself into the anonymity of office work, seeking solace in routine and crowded city streets. Decades passed. I grew older, weathered, the terror gradually fading into a dull lake. And then, one day, I was scrolling through online news when a headline caught my eye. Unexplained mutilations baffle Arizona ranchers. The photo accompanying the article sent a jolt of icy recognition through me. Livestock carcasses, eerily similar to the ranger all those years ago. The reports mentioned sightings of some spindly, unidentified creature by terrified witnesses. My breath hitched. It was back. Or maybe it had never left. Maybe there were more. Should I have reached out, tried to warn them? That old guilt nod at me. But what use is the word of a broken old man, haunted by a monster most would dismiss as delusion? Still, a sense of purpose sparked within me, something I hadn't felt in years. I began compiling everything I could find, similar disappearances, unexplained killings, whispered legends from the fringes of the Internet. I mapped them, drew connections, piecing together a terrifyingly clear picture. Whatever these creatures were, they were out there, lurking in the shadows of the wild places. They might be what the Native Americans called skinwalkers, the Navajo shapeshifters of myth. Maybe they were something older still, a relic species humanity was never meant to find. Whatever the truth, I wouldn't hide from them anymore. 
I wouldn't let the memory of that ranger and countless others vanish without a fight. The old laptop sits on a worn desk, its screen flickering with grainy images and cryptic notes. Silas Ward, the man who vanished months ago after a sudden obsessive flurry of activity, is rumored to be mad, a recluse driven to delusion by past trauma. Little do they suspect the truth. Underneath the floorboards, hidden in a dusty trunk, rests a meticulously assembled arsenal. Modified hunting rifles, silver-tipped ammunition, tattered field guides filled with annotations on anatomy and behavior of an unknown predator. And there is the map, crisscrossed with sightings, meticulously updated. Ward might have been physically frail now, but his mind, honed by years of relentless research, is a weapon far more dangerous. He is not a man-man. He is a hunter. He is the watcher on the wall, the one man standing between humanity and the monstrous truth hidden in the forgotten corners of the world. I was born and raised on the reservation in the 1960s. Name's Nathaniel Taltrees. It's funny, with a name like that, destiny put me into forestry and logging. Our small crew was contracted to clear some old growth up in the Olympic Peninsula, Washington State. Not the most exciting work, but it paid, and the air was good. We'd been out there a week or so. Tough job, trees were thick, ground was uneven. Then, things got, well, let's say unusual. We started finding things that didn't make sense. Animal carcasses deer, elk, but they weren't just dead. They were torn apart, insides strewn, bones shattered in impossible ways. Never seen anything like it. Now, my dad was a hunter, taught me to track and this wasn't right. Whatever did this, it was big, and it was messy. Way too messy for a bear or a cougar, even the biggest ones. The guys got spooked, some muttering about old stories, spirits and such. But me? I'm practical. I figured there had to be something real doing this. Then came the disappearances. First was Carl. He wandered off at lunch, probably for a quick pee behind a tree. He didn't come back. We fanned out, calling for him. Nothing. No answer, no trace. Like he just vanished into the forest. The next day, it was Jerry. Went for a smoke break, and poof gone. Now the crew was on edge. The foreman, a big burly guy named Hank, radioed for backup, told the rangers about the carcasses, told them we suspected someone or something dangerous was out there. They said they'd send a team out, but it would take days to get there. We didn't wait for them. Hank figured it was best to pack up and get out of there, but even with the truck headlights, the darkness under those trees felt like it was pressing in. Every rustle, Every snap of a twig made us jump. We couldn't shake the feeling we were being watched. Then I saw it. Just a glimpse out of the corner of my eye, huge and dark, moving between the trees. It was way too big to be a man, and it moved too fast, too quiet. My blood ran cold. I knew then that whatever was out there, it wasn't natural. It was something else. Hank! I hissed. Did you see that? Hank froze, his eyes wide. See what, Nate? What the hell spooked you? I couldn't explain. It was like a shadow, gone as quickly as it appeared. But the feeling stayed with me. The feeling of being hunted. We reached the clearing where we parked the truck. Relief washed over us. We were almost out of those woods. Hank tossed me the keys. Nate, you get us out of here. I'll cover the rear. I fumbled with the ignition, 
the truck's engine coughing to life. The headlights cut a weak path through the trees. And that's when I saw it again. This time it was right there, at the edge of the light. Massive. Taller than any man, hunched over, with skin like old tree bark. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow in the headlights, reflecting back at me like an animal's. Then it lunged. Hank, get in! I screamed. I heard a crash, Hank's panicked shout, and then something slammed into the back of the truck, rocking it violently. I floored the gas pedal, tires spinning, throwing up mud and gravel as I swerved onto the logging road. In the rearview mirror, I saw it, the creature, chasing after us, gaining ground with terrifying speed. Hold on! I yelled to Hank, who was scrambling back into the cab, pale as a ghost. The creature was relentless. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush, its guttural growls sending chills down my spine. The road twisted and turned, but it kept up the pace. Hank was fumbling with his rifle, his face a mask of terror. Nate, what the hell is that thing? I don't know, I shouted back, eyes fixed on the road. But it's gonna catch us. Ahead I saw a break in the trees, a dirt track leading away from the main road. Without thinking, I jerked the wheel, sending the truck careening off course. The creature roared in anger, but we were out of its immediate reach. The track was narrow, barely wide enough for the truck. I bounced over ruts and rocks, tree branches whipping at the windows. Hank was clutching his rifle, breathing heavily. Where are you going? There's an old ranger station up this way. I gasped. Maybe we can find help there. The track wound on for what felt like hours, the forest closing in around us. Then, finally, a clearing. A small, dilapidated cabin sat amidst the overgrown foliage. I slammed on the brakes, and we jumped out, the truck still running. The cabin was dark and abandoned. The door creaked open, and we stumbled inside, hearts pounding. Anyone here? Hank called out, his voice shaking. Nothing but silence. Dust hung thick in the air, undisturbed for years. We moved from room to room, searching for signs of life, a radio, a weapon, anything. Then we found it. In a back room, a stack of old ranger logs, filled with reports and sightings. I flipped through the pages frantically, my eyes scanning the faded handwriting. There were reports of strange creatures seen in the woods, of livestock mutilated, of people going missing without a trace. Hank was over my shoulder, his breath hot on my neck. What are you looking at, Nate? I pointed to a passage dated a few years back. It described a creature matching exactly what we had seen, massive, bark-like skin, glowing eyes. The ranger who wrote the report theorized it was some sort of, well, the word he used was, cryptid, something unknown to science. A chill ran down my spine. We weren't just dealing with a dangerous animal. We were dealing with a monster. Just then, a loud thud echoed from outside. The creature had found us. Hank whimpered, his rifle shaking in his hands. What do we do? What do we do? I shut the logbook, a surge of determination replacing my fear. We survive. I scanned the room, my mind racing. There had to be something we could use as a weapon. A fireplace poker, an old axe, anything. Behind you, Nate! Hank yelled. I spun around just as the creature crashed through the window, sending shards of glass flying. It roared, a deafening sound that echoed through the cabin. Hank fired his rifle the blast momentarily filling the room with smoke and the acrid smell of gunpowder. The monster stumbled, but it didn't fall. It's barely slowing it down. 
Hank screamed over the din. We scrambled around the room, desperate for an escape route. The back door was barricaded with old furniture. The windows were too small for us to squeeze through. We were trapped. The creature stalked towards us, its yellow eyes blazing with fury. Hank swung his rifle like a club, but the creature swatted it aside like a fly. Hank stumbled back, falling against the wall. I knew I had to do something. Grabbing a heavy cast-iron skillet from a shelf, I charged at the beast, screaming a primal yell that echoed my ancestors' battle cries. I swung the skillet with all my might, aiming for its head. The blow connected with a sickening thud, and the creature staggered. I kept swinging, fueled by a desperate surge of adrenaline. It roared and tried to grab me, its massive claws gouging furrows in the wall. Hank scrambled to his feet and grabbed the poker from the fireplace. He jabbed it into the creature's side, distracting it. I seized the moment, swinging the skillet one last time, catching it square in the temple. The creature let out a strangled cry and collapsed to the floor, its limbs twitching. Silence fell over the cabin, broken only by our ragged breathing. Is it... is it dead? Hank whispered, his voice trembling. I approached the creature cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest. Its skin was rough and gnarled, resembling the bark of an ancient tree. Its eyes had dulled, no longer reflecting that terrifying yellow glow. It was still. Relief washed over me, then a wave of nausea as the reality of what we had done hit me. We had killed something, something that shouldn't exist according to the laws of nature. We spent the rest of the night in the cabin, too terrified to sleep. At first light, we ventured outside. The creature's body was still there, a grotesque testament to the night's horrors. We left it where it lay, fleeing the scene like criminals running from their crime. We made it back to civilization, shaken but alive. We told the authorities about the massacre in the forest, about the disappearances, but we left out the part about the creature. They chalked it up to a rogue bear or a mountain lion, and the missing men were labeled as tragic outdoor accidents. Life moved on, but we were forever changed. The creature haunted my nightmares for years. I saw its glowing eyes every time I closed mine, heard its guttural roars in the silence of the night. Hank struggled too, eventually turning to alcohol to numb the memories. We drifted apart unable to share the burden of what we had witnessed. It wasn't until much later, while researching old legends, that I stumbled upon a possible explanation. The stories spoke of forest guardians, ancient spirits who took the form of monstrous creatures to protect their domain. They were rarely seen, and even more rarely provoked to violence. And then it hit me. That clearing where we had worked— it must have been sacred ground to the creature, a place it guarded fiercely. We had unwittingly trespassed, bringing down its wrath upon us. The twist? We weren't the heroes of the story. We were the villains. We had slain a protector, a creature that existed outside our understanding of the natural world. The consequences of our actions, the ripple effects on the delicate balance of the forest— will never truly know their extent. The guilt still weighs on me, a reminder of the darkness that sometimes hides within ourselves, and the unfathomable secrets that the wilderness still holds. My name's Ethan Grant. Been with the agency 15 years and this happened to me in 2019. Before then, I'd handled counterintelligence, mostly. Desk jockey with a knack for sniffing out bad apples, the kind of stuff that never makes the news. Then came this assignment. They called it. 
anomalous wildlife incidents, which translated means the stuff even the widows and other departments couldn't explain away. I'm not a superstitious guy, figured it'd be disgruntled ranchers, bad intel, that kind of thing. First case took me to Wyoming. Vast, empty stretch of land, not a person for miles. Reports of mutilated cattle. Locals whispered chupacabra, but those old tales were all we had. Sheriff was a no-nonsense type named Clara. Didn't believe in monsters, but you could see the strain behind her eyes. That place had a way of getting to you. Examined one of the carcasses. It wasn't like any predator I'd ever seen. Wounds were precise, surgical. Almost like it dissected the poor thing. But I had a job to do, so I set up cameras, night vision, the works. Then, just waited. Nights out there are different. Silence becomes this thing pressing down on you. And the stars, they're so damn close, like they could reach out and pluck you from the earth. Got me thinking all kinds of crazy thoughts. Third night it happened. Saw movement flicker on the monitor. Grainy image, but enough. This thing, it wasn't an animal. Tall, hunched, moving with a jerking, unnatural grace. Its skin looked smooth, hairless, but somehow textured. Its head, bulbous, too big for its body. And the eyes... That's what got me. Wide, set low on its face, and shining faintly even in the darkness. Not like reflected light. They glowed with their own internal source. My heart started pounding. This, this violated everything I thought I knew about the world. The creature approached a cow, its long spindly arms reaching out. Then, the connection cut out, camera feed just static panic surged through me. I grabbed my rifle, even though I knew it was probably useless, then burst out of the trailer. The creature was hunched over the cow. But it wasn't feeding. It had this, proboscis, this long, tubular thing inserted into the animal's hide. Was it draining it? Laying eggs? I didn't know and didn't want to get close enough to find out. Took aim. Squeeze the trigger. The sound cracked through the night, impossibly loud. The creature let out a piercing shriek and dropped the cow, whipping around to face me. Its eyes burned brighter, filled with what I can only describe as a malevolent intelligence. It lunged. I barely had time to raise my rifle before it slammed into me. Pain exploded from my shoulder, and I went down hard. I scrambled back, trying to get another shot off, but it was too fast. Leaping, circling me with that unsettling, jerking movement. Desperation fueled me. I swung the rifle like a club, managed to connect with its side. The thing hissed, stumbling backwards. It looked at me with those glowing eyes, and it was almost like it was, weighing its options. Then... With a final echoing shriek, it darted off into the darkness. I was left alone in the field, gasping for breath, wounded, and staring at the empty night. It took hours to gather myself enough to limp back to the trailer. Reported the incident, like a good little agent. But they treated it like equipment malfunction, possible drug-induced hallucination. Even showed me satellite imagery with zero heat signatures matching my description. Like I never even saw the damn thing. Clara gave me a sympathetic look over coffee before I left. Said, This land gets in your blood. Makes you see things, especially if you're looking hard enough. She was right, of course. But sometimes, I lie awake at night and feel those eyes on me that alien intelligence. Makes me wonder. Months later, there were more incidents. Similar reports spattered across the continent. Sometimes, a lone rancher would disappear, never to be found. 
They pulled me from field duty, buried me in paperwork analyzing the cases. Every new file felt like a break in the wall they were building between me and the truth. I knew there were others in the agency who'd seen things, things filed away in locked vaults. Things like me. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. Walked into my director's office, turned in my badge. Couldn't be complicit in the lie, even if it meant living on the fringe. Now I drift, taking odd jobs, keeping my eyes peeled at the edge of the woods, the corner of the street. I know the truth is out there, because I've seen it. And I know that one day, I'll see those glowing eyes again, and then, well, then we'll finish what we started in that Wyoming field. My name's Marcus Pierce, and this happened to me in 2009. You won't find me in any official handbook, understand? My section deals with unconventional threats, the kind that can't be explained away. Before this, I was a hotshot field agent, the cocky James Bond type. This assignment, it took that right out of me. Our intel led us to the Ozarks. Seemed a group of hikers had gone missing, not an unusual occurrence, until the remains of one turned up. The body. I'd been in Fallujah, but this was pure nightmare. Like someone had turned him inside out. Local PD was baffled, of course. That's where we step in. My partner, Jenna, and I posed as forest service reps. Locals weren't too chatty. Found whispers of old legends, something they called the haint, a thing of the woods. Figured it was superstitious nonsense, but out there, alone at night, you start to doubt everything you know. Second weekend, Jenna went out on a solo recon mission. Should have gone with her, but I had the intel to sift through, and arrogance can be as deadly as any weapon. She was supposed to radio in every two hours. She didn't. I waited until dawn, then took the jeep out to search. Found it abandoned at the edge of the woods. No sign of her. Radio was dead. I called in backup, but protocol demanded a waiting period, red tape and all that. That was my second mistake. I went in alone. Stupid move, maybe, but I wasn't about to sit and wait. Should have been smart, but I was driven by fear, the guilt gnawing at me. The woods were different that day, thicker somehow. Shadows seemed to shift on their own. That's when I saw it. Not the whole thing, mind you. Just an arm, impossibly long and skeletal, reaching out from behind a tree trunk. Too thin, too many joints, not human. I kept my cool, retreated slowly. Heard branches snapping further in, as if it was circling me. I found Jenna's pack by a stream, ripped open. Inside, her camera. I hesitated, then played back the footage from the night before. Her voice, shaky. Rustling noises. Then in the darkness, those eyes. Two glowing orbs in a misshapen shadow of a head. Jenna screaming. Then the thing lunged, and the camera went dark. I didn't think. I just ran. Tripped over exposed roots, scrambled up, kept running, heart pounding like a war drum. It was behind me, gaining, breaking branches with its unnatural strength. The noise, that clicking, rasping sound. It was toying with me, I knew. Hunting for sport. I reached a clearing, and there was an abandoned cabin. Burst in, found a rifle in the corner. Not an ideal weapon against this, whatever it was, but it was something. The thing didn't rush in. It watched from the tree lean. I could feel those eyes boring into me, predatory intelligence within them. I waited, rifle clutched white tight. Hours passed. 
sun started to dip. Maybe it was done with the game, ready to finish me off. Then came the rustling from the undergrowth. It was flanking me. I fired a shot out the window, shattering the glass. The creature hissed in surprise and darted away, affording me a better look, tall, emaciated, skin stretched tight over bone like worn leather, and that clicking rasping sound, it was coming from its weirdly jointed legs. I had wounds to tend and supplies to gather, but I knew I couldn't rest yet. That thing would be back. I scanned the cabin and found an old map of the surrounding area. There was a logging road a few miles out that might connect with the trailhead. Just a sliver of hope, but the sun was setting and it was that or waiting to die in the dark. I made it out under the cover of twilight, found the road, and walked through the night. Kept imagining those clicking legs in pursuit, the toothy silhouette against the moon. I must have looked half mad by the time I reached a ranger station. Spilled out my story, begged for help. They thought I was delusional, concussed, probably on drugs. Except, they took one look at my shredded clothes, saw the fear in my eyes, and they sent out a search party anyway. Didn't find a trace of Jenna. As for the creature, official report says bear attack, but I know the truth. I've seen the thing that lives behind the curtain of the natural world. And it saw me. They gave me a psych eval, two weeks of mandatory leave, and then, back to the office. My boss, let's call him Carter, sat me down. Tried the friendly act at first, but his eyes were cold. Made it clear they'd swept the whole thing under the rug, that wild animal attacks don't inspire investor confidence. But there was a glint in Carter's eye too, a hungry curiosity. He knew I wasn't lying. He knew there was something more out there. That's when the other offer started. Not field ops, no more gunfights with cartels. Labs, research facilities, all off the books. Analyzing things the regular scientists couldn't explain. Things brought in from dark corners of the globe, and sometimes from right here in the good old U.S. of A. I took the deals. Figured it was the only way to maybe understand, maybe find some trace of Jenna. Besides, sitting in a gray cubicle wasn't going to cut it after, after the Ozarks. The years became a blur. Weird artifacts, half decayed tissue samples from God knows where, and rumors. Whispers in hushed hallways of other facilities, other creatures like the haint. Sometimes I even found myself hoping for a mission, some tangible threat, instead of this creeping dread that seeped into my bones. Then came the call about Alaska. A remote Inuit village, disappearances and those same damn glowing eyes reported in the darkness. Carter put me on a plane the next morning. This time, I was the expert. I arrived to a community gripped by terror. Their stories eerily echoed the Ozark whispers. The hunters who vanished, the creature they called the Shadow Walker, the guttural cries echoing through the tundra. We set up camp, a mix of agents and hand-picked locals. Nights were spent scanning the desolate landscape, waiting for anything. Locals got jumpy with every creak of the ice. I felt it too, the prickling on the nape of my neck, the unshakable sense that we weren't alone. Then, the blizzard hit. A wall of howling white. Our tech was useless. We were holed up in flimsy tents, cut off from the world. That's when the screaming started. One of the villagers dragged kicking from his shelter. We found him torn apart a hundred yards away, surrounded by tracks that made no sense. They looked like clawed hands, but far too big, too widely spaced. We hunkered down, every rustle of the wind setting us on edge. And me. I knew there was only one way this would end. It was like I was back in those woods, prey, waiting for the inevitable. 
It came in the final hours of the storm, a monstrous shape lumbering through the swirling snow. I caught glimpses, the impossibly long limbs, the hunched, elongated torso, and those eyes burning through the whiteout. Panic fractured the group. Gunshots rang out, barely more than firecrackers against that thing. It rushed, and two agents went down in a flurry of torn limbs and guttural snarls. I was rooted to the spot, a flashback to Jenna's camera footage. But this time, something snapped inside me. It wasn't duty or training, just raw fury. I charged the creature, my own scream merging with the storm. I remember grabbing its leg, pulling it down. Muscle and sinew felt like old rope beneath my grip. Its claws raked my side. I aimed my gun and fired point-blank into its torso. The creature howled, a sound of pain and shock, and thrashed. I lost my grip and was flung back, slamming into the snowdrift. The last thing I saw as I blacked out was its silhouette retreating into the swirling whiteness. I woke up in a hospital bed, bandaged up, with a hell of a story they didn't believe. Said I must have been attacked by a polar bear, suffered head trauma in the blizzard. Carter was there, all smiles, offering me a desk job where it was. Safe. I looked him dead in the eye and told him exactly where he could shove that desk. I walked out, bought a used pickup and drove south, no plan, just away. Still see those damn eyes in my dreams, hear the clicking rasp in every shadow. The aftermath is, there is no aftermath. No closure, no going back to a normal life. I drift from town to town, odd jobs to keep gas in the tank. Some nights I pick a fight in some backwoods bar, almost hoping one of the locals is more than they seem, hoping to settle this thing once and for all. Because that's the worst part, the thing that gnaws at my soul. It knows I'm out there somewhere. We're bound together now, hunter and hunted. And one day, in some dark stretch of forgotten highway or in the heart of a silent forest, our paths will cross again. Maybe then, finally, one of us won't walk away. The Pacific Crest Trail in 1991, that's where it all began. I was 24 back then, fresh out of college, itching to see something beyond dorm rooms and lecture halls. My name's Elroy, Elroy Finch. Folks thought it was an odd pairing, an old-fashioned name on a guy with more wanderlust than sense. But hey, at that point, solo through hiking the PCT seemed like the height of sense. California to Canada on foot, months on the trail. I couldn't fathom a greater adventure. My buddy Jake wasn't as convinced. He opted for a safe road trip down the coast. We agreed to reconvene in Crater Lake, Oregon, a few weeks later. It was a long parting, but the excitement kept the ache at bay. I thrived on the trail. The solitude, the rhythm of walking, the way starlight looked so big and bright outside of city limits. Sure, there were blisters, bad weather, and nights when loneliness hit hard but that was all part of the challenge. Up until that point, the worst I'd encountered were a few startled deer. That's what made finding the camp so jarring. It was on the shoulder of a nameless peak in the southern Cascades, a bit off trail, tucked under some gnarled old trees. Wouldn't have even spotted it if I hadn't needed to take a leak. Whoever had been there was gone, but not for long. Ragged a tent, Empty food wrappers, cold fire pit. They were sloppy, but also recent. My first thought was maybe some other through hiker in a pinch. Then I saw the stains on the ground. Not rust or spilled food, blood. Lots of it, some fresh, some dried brown. 
That gut feeling everyone talks about. Mine kicked in hard. Something wasn't right. Getting spooked in the woods is one thing. Doing something about it is another. I decided the smart play was hightailing it back to the trail and reporting it to the next ranger I came across. Only, my feet didn't seem to agree. Curiosity's a powerful drug, especially mixed with a stubborn streak. I convinced myself I just needed a peek to know what had gone down. The tent flap was open. Inside, it was a disaster. Backpack torn apart, gear scattered like a wild animal had gotten in there. That's when I found the journal. Leather-bound, tucked under an overturned sleeping bag. Now, I ain't one for snooping, but this felt different. Underneath the dates scrawled on the first page, there was a shaky message. It comes at night. My breath hitched. I flipped through, a growing sense of dread creeping up my spine. The handwriting was jerky, frantic in places. They described noises in the trees, the feeling of being watched, finding half-eaten animal carcasses just off the trail. Then, a few days back, an entry that ended mid-sentence. It was like whoever wrote it had been yanked away in a hurry. I was about to shove the journal in my pack, tell myself I'd become way too invested in this, when I caught sight of something from the corner of my eye. Movement, outside the tent. My heart leaped into my throat. There, hunched beneath the trees, was a figure. Tall. Way taller than any person ought to be, and rail thin. Its skin looked gray in the dappled light, tight across its bones. It said, Lord, I wish I could take that image back. Skull-like, eyes like black pools, and a mouth full of way too many teeth. It stared at me, head cocked to the side like a twisted bird. Jake? The name escaped me before I could think. Pure, primal instinct. The creature let out a sound a clicking hiss that echoed in the quiet clearing. And then it lunged. I don't remember much after that, scrambling back, the tear of canvas as I ripped through the tent, stumbling blindly into the woods. Every crack of a branch sounded like it was right behind me. I ran until my lungs were on fire, until my legs gave, until the sun dipped below the horizon and I was lost in the dark. Didn't matter if it found me. I was done. The PCT, the freedom, it all seemed like a fool's errand compared to simply staying alive. I curled up against a moss-covered boulder and tried to make myself small. When cries echoed through the trees, piercing the night, I didn't doubt they were meant for me. Come morning, the sounds were gone. I staggered back to the trail, eventually hitched a ride to Crater Lake. No sight of Jake. His car was still in long-term parking. They launched a search after I told my story, but turned up nothing. No sign of the camp, no trace of Jake, and absolutely zero explanation from me about why I'd gone off trail in the first place. Folks called me crazy. Maybe I am. After that, there was no more big adventure, just getting by. I stick to city streets now, crowded and noisy. Sometimes, I swear I see that toothy grin flash in a darkened alleyway, or catch that black-eyed gaze over the heads of a subway crowd. But it's never more than a flicker, and that lingering dread begins to fade, almost. This happened to me on October 6, 1993. Back then, I was still green as grass, a rookie cop named Jonas Beck, patrolling the quiet town of Pine Ridge nestled deep in the forested hills of northern West Virginia. I was young eager for action, the type that figured small-town life was full of speeding tickets and lost dogs. Sure, I'd heard the old whispers of folks going missing up in those woods, 
but chalked it up to moonshiner tall tales. Then came that night, and my whole world shifted on its axis. It started with a routine 911 call, disturbance at the old Tyler place, an overgrown farmhouse on the edge of town known for its eccentric owner, Elias Tyler. Old man Tyler was the town's certified crazy person, always ranting about things in the woods, howling at the moon, that sort of thing. Still, a call's a call, so I went out to humor the guy. I pulled up the dirt driveway and the first thing that hit me was the stench. Like rotting meat and something else, something sour and acrid. A prickle of unease went down my spine. This wasn't your regular drunk and disorderly situation. The house was dark, but there were sounds coming from the shed out back banging and low, guttural growls. Not exactly human sounding. I called for backup, then cautiously made my way around the house. The shed door was hanging open, and moonlight cut a path right across the dirt floor. I crept closer, gun drawn. And then I saw it, a hulking form hunched over something in the shadows. At first, I couldn't make it out, but as it turned towards the light, my gut clenched in icy horror. The creature was immense, well over seven feet tall, its body a grotesque patchwork of sinewy muscle and mottled gray skin stretched tight over bone. It had a wolfish head, elongated, full of razor-sharp teeth, and its eyes, God, those eyes. Twin orbs of burning yellow that seemed to bore right into my soul. Elias Tyler lay in a crumpled heap beneath it, his body torn and broken. The creature let out a snarl that sent shivers down my spine, then lunged at the opening in the shed where I was standing. I fired instinctively, the shots echoing in the small space. It roared and stumbled back, a spray of dark blood on its chest. But it wasn't enough. It charged again, a terrifying blur of teeth and claws. I barely managed to dive aside crashing into a stack of old tools. It wheeled around, those glowing eyes fixed on me. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding like a drum against my ribs. Just then, I heard the sirens. Backup had arrived. The sudden sound seemed to startle the creature. It hesitated, giving me just enough time to bolt for the open door of the shed. I didn't look back just ran for my life, the creature's snarls fading behind me. I stumbled back to the cruiser, fumbling with my keys as the other officers piled out shouting questions I couldn't answer. We stormed the shed, but found nothing. Not a trace of the monster, only poor Elias Tyler's ravaged body. I told them what I saw, my voice shaking, and I'll never forget the look of pity mixed with disbelief on their faces. They wrote it off as a wild animal attack, maybe some messed up mountain lion. But I knew what I saw. That thing was no animal I'd ever encountered. In the days that followed, I became the local laughingstock. Monster Cop was the nickname that stuck. The townsfolk figured I cracked under the pressure— or hallucinated on some backwoods moonshine. Yet, deep down, I knew the truth. And I knew something had to be done, even if no one would believe me. I started hitting the old hunting trails, keeping an eye out for anything unusual, but the woods mostly kept their secrets. One moonlit night, while patrolling the back roads, I saw something flicker at the edge of the tree line. I pulled over, grabbing my flashlight. Heart pounding, I crept into the woods, the dead leaves crunching underfoot. And there, just for a second, I caught a glimpse of those yellow eyes watching me from the darkness. A low growl echoed through the trees, and my blood ran cold. It was out there, lurking. The rest of my patrol shift was spent with my skin crawling, the sense of being watched clinging to me like a shroud. That was the moment I realized this wasn't going to end. That creature, whatever it was, 
I had crossed paths with it, and now it had my scent. It was only a matter of time before it decided to strike again. Fear became my constant companion. I barely slept, jumping at every shadow. Every time my radio crackled, I braced myself for the report of another mole body, another missing person out in those deep woods. The looks from fellow officers burned worse than any monster's bite. I saw the whispers, felt the shift in how they spoke to me. My pleas for a proper investigation fell on deaf ears. No one wanted to entertain the notion that there was some unknown creature roaming the forests. They thought I was a liability, a danger. I began to wonder if they were right. Then came the night that changed everything. My shift was supposed to be quiet, a few traffic stops at most. But fate, it seemed, had other plans. Dispatch sent out a call. A family reported missing near an old logging trail just off County Road 12. My heart sank. I knew that trail. It wound deep into the heart of the woods, the area where I'd first seen it. Still, I couldn't ignore the call. I couldn't be the one who sat back and let others walk into that nightmare. The radio updates were grim. Search and rescue found the family car abandoned, doors open, traces of a struggle. No sign of the family of father, mother, and their young daughter. A knot of dread twisted in my gut. This was it. This was where I had to make a stand. I drove to the scene the headlights barely penetrating the thick, clinging fog that seemed to be a hallmark of that cursed place. The other officers were there, a mix of resignation and skepticism on their faces. I told them I was going in alone, the creature knew me, wouldn't strike at a group. It was a half-truth, a desperate gamble. After some protest, they relented. One of the older deputies, Miller, pressed a shotgun into my hands. Just in case, he said, a hint of understanding in his eyes. I stepped into the woods, the shotgun feeling pitifully inadequate. Each step was agony, the rustle of leaves and the snap of twigs sounding like gunshots in the tense silence. I could practically feel the eyes on me, tracking my every move. That familiar stench, rotten acid, wafted through the trees. It took what felt like an eternity to reach the spot where the car was found. There were more signs of struggle, torn fabric, streaks of blood on the ground, and small footprints that made my stomach churn. There was nothing to do but follow the trail deeper into the darkness. That's when I heard the whimper, faint and muffled as if from a distance. Panic surged through me. It was the little girl. I ran, stumbling over roots and rocks, the whimpers growing louder. Then I burst into a small clearing, and the scene that unfolded has haunted my nights ever since. The creature held the girl in its massive claws, her small form limp and unmoving. I saw the streaks of blood on her clothes, her pale face. The monster was crouched over something else, its back to me. As it turned, I saw it was devouring the remains of her parents, its muzzle smeared with blood. Rage and despair warred within me. I raised the shotgun, aiming at its head. The roar it let out was deafening, and it dropped the girl, charging straight at me. I fired once, twice. The buckshot tore into its chest, and it staggered, but kept coming. Just as its claws were about to rake across my face, a gunshot echoed from behind me. I whirled around to see Miller and a few of the other deputies at the edge of the clearing, weapons raised. A volley of gunfire echoed through the trees, and the creature finally faltered, crashing to the ground with a shuddering thud. Numb with shock and horror, I approached the girl. Mercifully, she was still alive whimpering and scared, but alive. I scooped her into my arms, holding her tight as the world dissolved into a blur around me. 
aftermath the incident was a bloodbath. For dead, including the creature, its existence now impossible to deny. I was hailed as a hero, albeit a haunted one. The aftermath wasn't the clean-cut victory you see in movies. News crews swarmed the town, scientists descended upon the creature's body. Theories abounded about what it was and where it came from. They never did find a definitive answer. Some say the creature was some government experiment gone rogue. Others blame toxic waste from some forgotten dumping ground. The old-timers whispered of ancient legends, spirits of the deep woods given terrible form. Me? I don't know what to believe anymore. All I know is that out there, in the shadows where the wild things dwell, there are horrors beyond our understanding. They couldn't hush up the incident completely. Word leaked stories of the Pine Ridge Monster became local legend, a campfire tale whispered to frightened children. But I know the truth. The memory of that night, of the girl's tear-streaked face, will never leave me. My heroism came at a price. They gave me medals, shook my hand, and sent me back out on patrol. But they don't see the way I flinch at every rustle in the trees, the way the shadows seem to stretch out like claws when I'm on those lonely back roads. The town of Pine Ridge eventually returned to some kind of normalcy. The tourists come now, morbidly curious, but the locals still give the woods a wide berth. Me, I stayed on the force for a few more years. Saved a few lives, dealt with my share of drunks and petty thieves. It was never the same, though. Finally, I couldn't take it any more. Turned in my badge and left Pine Ridge for good. I live in a small coastal town these days. The sound of the ocean soothes something in me that the forest never could. I try to lead a normal life. Got married, started a family. But on some nights, I lie awake and hear the echoes of growls in the wind, see the gleam of yellow eyes in the darkness beyond my window. And I know, deep down, that it's never truly over. This happened to me on July 4th, 1999. I was 26. I'm Gerhardt. I always like going out and getting away to my cabin in the Ozarks. It's remote. I can relax there. I don't see anyone for days. My buddy Riker went with me this time. I met Riker in college. We became pretty close. His family has a bunch of cabins a little further into the woods than mine. This was our yearly thing. We pulled up in my truck. We got out and stretched. We got our gear out. Riker started unpacking the cooler. Did you get everything? He asked. I think so. Firewood, food, the usual. You bring the fishing stuff? Course. He shut the truck door. I put my stuff in the cabin. We'd relax and fish for a day, then settle in for some fireworks. We fished till dark. I didn't catch anything. Riker pulled in about four big catfish. Pretty good day for him. I cleaned the fish. He got the fire going. We grilled the fish. He opened a couple of beers. I'm gonna turn in, he said after we ate. I was beat too. I got up to go inside. That's when I heard something big scrambling away behind the cabin. I turned. I couldn't see anything. What was that? I asked. Riker yawned. Probably just critters. Coons or something. I nodded. Right. He headed inside. I lingered beside the fire for a while. I didn't like the sound. Too heavy for a raccoon. More like a deer, maybe. I turned in finally. Something about the woods felt. Off. The next morning, 
Riker was already gone when I woke up. He left a note on the counter. Gone fishing. Back for lunch. I ate and did some chores around the cabin. I split some firewood and fixed a loose hinge on the door. Around noon, Riker wasn't back yet. That wasn't like him. It was pretty easy to fish all day, but he always stuck to plans. I got worried. I walked the woods to the spot where he liked to fish. There was no sign of him. His truck was back at his cabin. I got the uneasy feeling again. That same sense of something wrong. I searched till it started getting dark. Still nothing. I was freaking out. The next day, I called the park ranger station. My buddy went missing, I told them. They sent someone to take down my statement. They started a search party. We walked the area for days. There was no sign of him. At all. I went home. I couldn't stop wondering what happened. I couldn't even guess. It was a complete mystery. Then it happened to me. Three summers later. I was at the cabin alone this time. The same uneasy feeling came back full force. It was that night, too. I made dinner and ate. I did dishes. I stacked firewood on the porch. It was late. I was getting ready for bed. I was in the back room, changing into my pajamas, when something slammed into the front door. I went totally still. It hit the door again. Hard. The whole cabin shook. My heart was pounding. I tiptoed to the front window and peeked around the curtain. The porch light shone on something massive, hunched over on the steps. It wasn't like anything I'd ever seen. It was huge, over eight feet tall, built broad and thick. Coarse, brownish fur covered its body. It stood on two powerful legs, but it had claws on its hands too like some messed-up bear hybrid. The face, though. Narrow, almost snout-like. Long, pointed ears jutted up from its head. Its eyes gleamed yellow in the darkness, filled with, not anger, exactly, but pure hunger. I backed away from the window. I was shaking. What the hell was that thing? It rammed the door again. The wood groaned. I had to get out. I couldn't go out front. I ran through the cabin to the back. I threw open the door and bolted into the woods behind the house. I could hear it, smashing through the front of the cabin, sniffing and growling as it followed. It chased me through the trees. Branches whipped my face. I tripped over roots. I burst out of the tree line to the dirt road running past my place. My truck was parked at the side. I fumbled for my keys. I dropped them and bent to pick them up. The thing was behind me, its breath hot on my neck. I heard it snarl. Its powerful claws swiped at my back. I screamed. I don't know how I got the keys, how I opened the truck and clambered inside. I locked the doors. It paced around the truck, batting at the windows, roaring in frustration. Finally, it backed off. I started the truck and peeled out of there, tearing off down the road till I got to town. I went straight to the ranger station. I pounded on the door. They let me in. I was a mess, bloody and hysterical. They calmed me down, got my statement— they sent a search team out to my cabin. The thing was gone. They found my home trashed. They took photos of the huge claw marks, the ripped-up porch. They questioned me for hours. The rangers looked at each other. They looked at me sadly. Clearly, they didn't believe a word of my story. Probably figured I'd freaked out, destroyed my own cabin— maybe gotten into something while alone out there. I tried to tell them Riker went missing a few years ago, the same way. They brushed me off. 
Nobody in the world is gonna believe that story. I haven't gone back to my cabin since. I know that thing is still out there. I know it waits for someone else. Someone alone. Someone unaware. My name's Marcus Tillman. Been a trucker for longer than makes sense to admit. I ain't much for fancy living a hot meal. The comfort of my own bed, that's enough for me. But this year, 2002, it all went sideways. Landed a route that took me through Arizona. Now, that stretch of I-10 between Phoenix and Tucson? Beautiful in its own way, yeah, but also lonely as hell. Miles of saguaros and shimmering sand with nothing in sight but the occasional gas station or roadside diner. Cell service gets real spotty out there, too. The kind of place where you start feeling like the last man on earth. It was early evening when trouble rolled in. I was hauling a load of electronics and had a deadline to make, so I was pushing myself hard. Had some classic rock blasting to keep me company. That old CCR song about a bad moon rising playing just as the sun dipped below the horizon. Then, out of nowhere, a tire blew. The truck swerved, and for a heart-stopping moment, I thought I was a goner. But by some miracle, I managed to wrestle the rig to the side of the road. Cursing and sweating, I climbed out to assess the damage. Of course, I didn't have a spare. Wonderful. I did what anyone would, fired up the CB radio. Figured maybe another trucker within range could lend a hand. Nothing but static. Tried cursing again, but that didn't fix the tire either. Then I remembered, there was a dusty turnoff less than a mile back. Maybe one of those roadside places could help. Leaving the truck on the shoulder with the hazard lights blinking, I started walking back the way I had come. The back of my neck prickled uncomfortably. The desert twilight was throwing long, spooky shadows, and the wind hissed through the mesquite-like whispers. I started to pick up the pace. I hadn't gone far when I saw a glimmer of light up ahead. My heart leapt with relief. Must be the place, I thought. But as I got closer, something seemed off. It wasn't a proper building, looked more like an abandoned trailer or RV out on its lonesome. Even stranger, there was a campfire flickering next to it, even though the temperature was still in the triple digits. Hello? I called out, approaching cautiously. Nobody answered. The campfire crackled, and an acrid smell hung in the air. Something about the whole scene sent a chill down my spine. I should have turned around right then, listened to my gut. But I was desperate. As I drew closer, a figure rose from the shadows beside the campfire. Tall, rail-thin, he was dressed in faded jeans and a flannel shirt that hung loose on his skeletal frame. His face, God, I'll never forget that face. Sunken cheeks, skin tight and weathered like old leather. His eyes were the worst, though. Like empty sockets in the dim light, boring into me. He didn't speak, just stared with that unsettling gaze. A shard of panic sliced through me, and I took a step back. Hey, sorry to bother you. I stammered, my voice suddenly hoarse. Got a flat, just up the road. You think, you got a phone I could use? Still, the man said nothing. He just tilted his head slightly, like a bird sizing up its prey. That was when I noticed the other thing. His hands. Too long, the fingers ending in what looked like dirty, broken claws. And there was something smeared across his palms something dark and wet. Blood, the word whispered through my head, followed by a jolt of primal fear. I turned and ran. I didn't look back. Stumbled and sprinted blindly, 
the sound of my ragged breathing and blood pounding in my ears. I could imagine those bony hands reaching for me, those claws raking down my back. The truck seemed miles away when I finally broke out of the brush and onto the asphalt. I fumbled with the door handle, clawed my way into the cab, and slammed the lock down. Through the windshield, I saw the thin figure emerge from the darkness. He stood at the edge of the desert, silhouetted against the faint glow of the campfire, just watching. I started the engine with shaking hands, threw the truck into gear, and floored it. The headlights cut a swath through the night, and I didn't stop speeding until I reached the outskirts of Tucson. First gas station I found, I pulled in and practically collapsed out of the truck. My whole body trembled, and sweat soaked through my shirt. I went inside, found a payphone, and dialed 911 with fumbling fingers. Tried to explain what had happened, the man at the campfire, but the words stumbled out in a jumbled rush. I could tell the dispatcher didn't take me seriously, figured I was just a spook driver seeing things that weren't there. When the state troopers finally rolled in, I took them back to the place where I'd seen the trailer and the campfire. There was nothing left. Not a single trace. The cops exchanged a skeptical look, and I knew what they were thinking. Trucker on too many long hauls, finally cracked under the pressure. Didn't bother arguing. I just wanted to get the hell away from that godforsaken stretch of desert. They gave me a ride back to my truck, helped me get a tow service out, and sent me on my way. I finished the delivery under a haze of exhaustion and lingering fear. Every rustle of the wind, every shadow cast by the headlights, made me jump. But I pushed on, telling myself it was over, that I'd been imagining things. It wasn't over. A few weeks later, I was on a different route, up in Colorado this time. Stopped for the night in a small town off the interstate. Figured a proper meal and a bed would do me wonders after the ordeal in Arizona. Parked the truck in the motel's lot and went inside to register. As I was filling out the paperwork, my eye caught a newspaper spread open on the counter. A headline screamed at me. Hiker found dead. Possible animal attack. I felt a wave of nausea. My hand shook as I reached for the paper and read the article. The victim had been found in a remote area of the Rockies, his body. The description chilled me to the bone. Mutilated would be the right word, torn apart. The coroner couldn't identify what had done it, just that it wasn't any predator they'd ever encountered. And that was when the connection hit me with the force of a sledgehammer. The man I'd seen in the desert, those long, clawed hands, the blood, it wasn't my imagination, not a hallucination brought on by exhaustion. He was real. He was something else, something monstrous, and now, it seemed, he was on the move. I never went back to Arizona, refused any route that might take me near that stretch of I-10. It cost me some jobs, made things tight financially for a while. I didn't care. Better to be broke than end up like that poor hiker in Colorado. But I made a mistake. Got too complacent. About a year later, I took a run down to Texas. Figured enough time had passed. Whatever that thing was, it would be long gone. I was wrong. Driving back, I needed to stop for fuel in the middle of nowhere. West Texas. One of those lonely, desolate gas stations with flickering fluorescent lights and tumbleweeds blowing across the cracked pavement. I filled up the tank, grabbed a coffee to go, figuring I'd make a quick pit stop before pushing on. As I was heading back to the truck, I saw something flicker in my peripheral vision. I froze. Just beyond the dumpster, a tall, emaciated figure crouched in the shadows. It turned its head, and those hollow eyes locked with mine. A scream caught in my throat. 
It was him. That unnatural, bone-thin body, those clawed hands. He shouldn't have been possible, yet there he was. This time, he didn't just watch. The creature lunged, moving not like a man but some kind of twisted spider. I ran for the truck, fumbling with the keys, my heart pounding a frantic tattoo against my ribs. Just as I managed to yank the door open, those claws raked across the metal, leaving deep gashes in the paint. I slammed the truck into gear and gunned the engine. I glanced in the rearview mirror as I pulled away. The creature was standing by the dumpster, its head cocked to the side, watching me disappear down the road. I reported it, of course, told the local sheriff everything, even though I knew how it would sound. He didn't laugh outright, bless him, but I could see the disbelief in his eyes. They did a cursory search, found nothing, and the case went cold. To this day, I don't know what that thing is, or why it seems fixated on me. I try not to think about it, but some nights, when the wind howls outside and I'm all alone on the road, the fear creeps back in. He's still out there. I know he is. Waiting. My name is Caden, and this happened to me back in the fall of 2006. I'd been driving long haul for a good five years by then. Divorced, no kids, so there wasn't much keeping me tied down. The open road, yeah, it gets lonely, but it can also be freeing. That particular stretch, I was hauling a load of furniture from North Carolina up to New York. The Blue Ridge Parkway is supposed to be beautiful, especially in autumn. They weren't kidding about the blue part. Those mountains seemed to melt into the horizon, a hazy, layered tapestry of blues and purples. The crisp air, that sharp smell of leaves starting to turn, should have been a good run. Except I never made it to New York. The trouble started just outside of Asheville. There was a detour sign flashing up ahead some road construction scheduled way past normal working hours. Nothing to do but take the alternate route, a winding county road that cut through the mountains instead of the usual stretch of interstate. It added hours, but I figured better late than never. Night fell while I was still deep in the hills, the headlights cutting through thick fog that rolled in thick and sudden. I'd barely seen another car since I'd turned off, the forest looming close on either side of the two-lane road. That's when the first animal darted out, a deer, a blur of white tail disappearing back into the trees. I slammed the brakes, the rig lurching to a halt. Heart still pounding, I got out, flashlight in hand, to check for damage. Just as well I did. The fog muffled sound, and I would have missed it if I hadn't been right up next to the truck. But there it was a ragged rip in the tarp covering the back of the trailer. Something had clawed its way in. My hands shook a little as I secured the makeshift patch the best I could and forced myself back into the driver's seat. Whatever had done that, it was probably long gone now, spooked by the truck. Or so I told myself. The logical... Rational part of my brain was being drowned out by a rising sense of unease. The radio was dead, nothing but static and snatches of old gospel songs coming through the speakers. I switched it off, the silence pressing in. Up ahead, a flicker of light cut through the fog. A gas station, maybe? A diner? Please let it be a diner. I was starving and the thought of a greasy burger and strong coffee had suddenly become incredibly appealing. But what I found as I got closer wasn't what I expected. It was a house, more of a cabin really, a ramshackle place with faded paint and a sagging porch. A single dim bulb burned on the porch, casting an uneven circle of light that barely broke through the gloom. Still, 
I saw lights on inside. I pulled up, killed the engine, and got out slowly, every instinct screaming at me to get back in the truck and drive. But there was the ragged hole in my trailer, the cargo I had a responsibility to deliver, and my rumbling stomach. The place looked deserted, but the front door was slightly ajar. Maybe this was one of those places in the middle of nowhere where everyone knows each other, the kind where they don't bother locking up. I approached cautiously, calling out a tentative. Hello? The door creaked further open. My heart sank. I didn't like the looks of this, liked it even less when a foul odor wafted out into the cool night air, something sickly sweet and rotten like meat left out in the sun for too long. Anybody home? I tried again, my voice a little more forceful. The hairs on my arms started to prickle. I should have gone with my gut, turned around and found a place to sleep in the truck till morning. But some stubborn part of me insisted on playing this out. I was a grown man, after all, not easily spooked. With flashlight raised, I stepped through the doorway, bracing myself for whatever was waiting inside. The first thing that hit me was the heat. It was stifling in there, even with the front door open. The second, well, that was worse. The source of the stench became clear the minute the light beam swept across the far wall. Blood was smeared floor to ceiling, dark, dried-out smears, fresh spatters, and there— Bone. A pile of them in the corner, stripped clean. Animal bones, mostly, but there were a couple that looked a little too big. A little too human. And in the center of it all, a man. At first, all I could see was his back. Broad, hunched shoulders straining against the tattered fabric of a dirty t-shirt. He was focused on something in front of him, something on the floor. He made a snuffling sound, an eager, wet noise that made the skin on the back of my neck crawl. That's when he turned. The human mind isn't meant to process some sights. This was one of them. His face, what was left of it, wasn't the face of a man anymore. It was a raw, glistening mess. The nose was gone entirely, the cheeks ripped away the lips drawn back in a snarl that exposed rows of jagged teeth. His eyes, one milky and blind, the other fixed on me with a terrible intensity. A low, guttural growl rumbled in his throat, a sound less human than beast. I didn't wait for him to attack. I turned and ran, stumbled through the open door, the night air suddenly freezing on my sweat-slick skin. I fumbled the keys into the ignition, started the engine, and the truck lunged forward before I'd even gotten the door closed. Gravel flew as I sped back towards the main road. I risked one glance in the rearview mirror. The porch light illuminated his monstrous form as he stood framed in the doorway, watching me go. For one insane moment, I almost expected him to sprint after the truck on all fours but he didn't. Just stood there, silhouetted against the light, as the cabin grew smaller and smaller, swallowed by the fog and trees. The rest of that night was a blur. I drove without stopping until I reached the interstate. I finally pulled into a rest area just after sunrise. My whole body was shaking, my stomach churning. I must have thrown up half a dozen times. Even knowing I was miles away from that cabin, I couldn't shake the feeling of those eyes on my back. Had it been real? Some hallucination brought on by exhaustion and hunger? No. I'd seen what I'd seen. And whatever that thing was, I had a nasty feeling it wasn't alone out there. The police, well, that was an exercise in frustration. Sleepy small-town cops don't take kindly to truckers with wild stories about cannibal monsters in the woods. There was a perfunctory search, an officer taking down my report, but I could tell they didn't believe me. 
Figured I'd gotten into a fight with someone, torched my own rig, cooked up some crazy story to cover it up. My trucking company wasn't any more supportive. They took one look at the damaged trailer, heard enough of my rambling report, and promptly fired me. Insurance wouldn't cover the ruined cargo, let alone a new trailer. Within a week, I was jobless, my rig impounded, facing a lawsuit from the company for negligence. Desperate, I tried to investigate on my own. There were vague accounts of missing hikers, unsolved disappearances in state parks near where I'd been that night, but nothing conclusive. Locals gave me the stink eye. Outsiders aren't welcome in isolated towns, especially not the kind who start asking questions about strange happenings. Meanwhile, the nightmares wouldn't stop. That cabin, the gore-splattered room, the creature's hungry eyes. I jolt awake in a cold sweat, convinced that it was standing right there in the shadows of my crappy motel room. Started keeping a hunting knife under the pillow, figured it couldn't hurt. I tried to put it all behind me, find another job, something that wouldn't put me alone on deserted highways at night. It didn't work. Every time I got behind the wheel of a car, I felt that same crawling dread. The memory of those mountains, of the fog and that single light in the darkness, haunted me. It wasn't long before the drinking started. It was the only thing that could numb the fear, push the images back for a few hours. Didn't take long to cross the line from coping mechanism to full-blown addiction. I lost what little I had left. My car, the motel room, what was left of my sanity. A few months after that night in the mountains, I woke up behind a dumpster, a filthy blanket wrapped around me, my body aching from booze and withdrawal. The sky above was that same relentless blue it had been on the Blue Ridge Parkway. The sight of it snapped something inside me. I stumbled to a nearby payphone, the few coins in my pocket jingling with each unsteady step. Called my old army buddy, the one who had sworn a hundred times he'd always have my back. Begged him to take me in, mumbled something about needing a place to dry out, to get my head on straight. He didn't ask questions, bless him. Just gave me the address and the bus fare to get there. It's been ten years since I walked away from the wreckage of my old life. Ten years living off the grid in a little cabin in the New Mexico desert. My buddy, Jake, he's got a small ranch out there. Does odd jobs, keeps a few cattle, stays out of trouble. I work alongside him, keep to myself. The nightmares haven't entirely gone away, but they've faded a little. Out here... Under the vast desert sky, the darkness holds different horrors, but they feel older, less personal somehow. During the day, there's enough honest work to keep the demons at bay. At night, the bottle still calls to me sometimes. But there's also Jake, with his quiet patience and the unwavering belief that some wounds just need time to heal. And he's got a shotgun propped up next to the back door, just in case. I try not to think of how close I came to being another forgotten missing person's case, a ripped-up pile of bones on some monster's floor. Sometimes, on the darkest nights, I still catch a whiff of that rotten sweet smell on the desert wind, and a shiver runs through me. I check that the windows are bolted, that the shotgun is loaded. Folks say the mountains never forget what they've seen. Neither do I. I see those eyes, that blind, hungry stare, every time I close my own. Some scars, they run deeper than flesh and bone. Some kinds of darkness, once you let them in, they become a part of who you are. You don't get to outrun them. All you can do is find a patch of light, and hope it's enough to keep the shadows at bay.
It was a quiet afternoon in Fulton, Mississippi. My name is Darius Lennox, and being a small-town cop, I'd come to appreciate days like these. Lately, though, the tranquility has been shattered by an eerie string of disappearances. Walking down Main Street towards the station, I couldn't help but wonder what was going on. Other than those disappearances, it seemed like a typical day in Fulton. Conversations with locals were about mundane topics, baseball games, pie recipes, and the weather. My partner Luella Arquette joined me at the station as we discussed the case. So far there's no connection among these people, she noted while scattering case files across our shared desk. As we sifted through leads, I told her about my hometown outside Little Rock and how the sense of safety there kept me naive throughout my childhood. Luella appreciated my openness and shared that she grew up moving around frequently due to her dad's work. Our conversation was interrupted by a frantic dispatch call. A passerby reported finding bloody clothes near a hiking trail in Itawamba County. With adrenaline surging, we packed our bags with essentials, flashlights, gloves, and additional firearms, before speeding off towards the scene. As we approached the area, the dense forest loomed ominously before us. The woods seemed endless, trees stretched far into the fog-filled sky. After getting our bearings from local officers already on scene, we carefully followed the trail leading deeper into the woods. A chilling wind picked up as Luella discovered remains, bones stripped clean of flesh, scattered across a small clearing. We searched for identification but found none. These victims were just as much of a mystery as whatever or whoever took them down. Back at headquarters with hours spent researching similar cases across nearby counties, we discovered that gruesome incidents have been occurring every fifty years for over two centuries in these parts. The trail of disappearances painted a disturbing picture, people venturing into the woods, never to return, and ultimately, bones found scattered some time later. During these heightened periods, locals whispered of a monster stalking the depths of Itawamba County's forests. Luella barred me from pursuing the case any further, citing lack of substantial evidence and jurisdiction. I knew better, though. She was trying to protect me. I saw the fear in her eyes. But that wasn't about to stop me. Deep down, I felt responsible for these people. It was my duty to ensure their families had closure. So, against orders and safety precautions, I returned to the forest clearing alone while Luella was off on another assignment. Under the full moon and armed with a shotgun, I stumbled upon a cave hidden by roots and ivy. Entering cautiously, I discovered scratch marks on stone walls that revealed the truth. Those living near the forest have lived alongside an unspeakable terror for generations. Up ahead in the cave lay remnants of its victims' clothes, belongings, and bones bearing deep teeth marks. Determined to face this creature once and for all, I ventured further into dark depths until finally confronting the eyes of the beast. Standing at least eight feet tall with a hulking mass of black fur clinging to its massive body resembling both bear and man combined lay a gruesome thing that filled me with dread. Its elongated snout drooled venom over razor-sharp teeth. I steadied my weapon facing those monstrous eyes only inches away from my face when suddenly we heard Luella's voice ringing through cavernous space. Darius! Where are you? In that very moment, the creature lunged toward me, causing me to instinctively pull the trigger of my shotgun. Multiple pellets buried themselves into its horror-stricken face, staggering it for a brief moment, but not bringing it down. The force of the blast pushed me back, making me lose balance and drop my weapon. As I reached for my fallen shotgun, I glanced up and noticed Luella standing at the cave entrance armed with a high-powered rifle aimed at the monstrous beast. She pulled the trigger, 
and the sound echoed throughout the cave. The creature let out an agonizing sound unlike anything I had ever heard before as it attempted to shield itself from the barrage of bullets. The being turned tail and swiftly exited the cave, pushing past Luella in the process but not harming her. With no other choice and no signal within the deep woods to call for help, we decided to pursue the creature while maintaining a safe distance. We tracked it through the forest until we saw it enter an old abandoned cabin. Edging closer to its supposed hideout, Luella whispered, Darius, we need backup. This thing is beyond us. We retreated to higher ground where our phones got reception and called for reinforcements. Our hearts raced as we waited with only our guns for company and protection from this unknown abyssal creature. Eventually, a team arrived well-versed in dealing with dangerous wildlife. They listened carefully as we recounted our encounter in detail, while wearing skeptical expressions on their faces as they took in what had happened and just who or better yet what we were up against. With a plan in place, we approached the abandoned cabin only to find it empty. The creature had managed to slip past our surveillance, and escaped further into an uncharted territory of the wilderness leaving behind more questions than answers. The cleanup crew assessed damage inside that cavern of horrors hidden beneath roots, and ivy ultimately leading us to identifying many of its victims. As they pieced together the remains, the area offered little insight as to the origin or motivations of the creature we had faced. Our investigation would continue over the following days, but it became apparent that whatever that monster was, it had gone into hiding or perhaps moved on to a different hunting ground. At that point, we were forced to conclude our search. In the end, we couldn't overlook Luella's decision to defy orders and come after me. She saved my life that night but faced disciplinary action for her insubordination. After a while, things got back to normal, albeit a new normal shaped by our harrowing experience. As for the creature responsible for so much pain and suffering, it was never seen nor heard from again. Some might argue that our encounter only served to fuel further speculation and fear within Itawamba County's forests. However, now armed with some knowledge about its existence causing inhabitants to err on the side of caution when venturing near those woods especially at night had an overall positive impact steering them away from harm's way. To this day, I hold deep inside a tattoo of appreciation for Luella and her bravery in confronting an unknown terror yet at the same time etched into every fiber of my being is a lingering question that refuses to fade. What would have happened if she hadn't shown up that eerie night just in time? The memory still haunts me as I walk past the dark forest whispering secrets, only known by those who dwell within secrets, far beyond any earthly comprehension. My name is Hank Shoemaker and I'm a small-town cop in Benton, Arkansas. It was just another day at work, nothing out of the ordinary. My partner, Rufus Pritchett, and I were enjoying a laugh at some silly jokes when the radio crackled, disrupting our banter. Dispatch to Unit Bravo 12, are you available? I grabbed the radio. Yeah, dispatch. What's up? We have a missing person report. Head over to 615 Broadway Street for more information. Rufus and I exchanged puzzled glances as we started driving towards the address. Missing person cases were rare around here. Upon arriving, we met with a distressed woman named Alma Sauberbier. She told us her husband, Tobin, hadn't returned after going out on a walk last night. We searched all day around town but found no trace of Tobin. With each passing hour, my unease grew stronger. As darkness fell, Rufus and I decided to search the edge of town near the dense woodland. 
There was an old semi-abandoned sawmill on this side of town which had become a forgotten relic over time. We decided to split up and meet back by our cruiser after an hour. As I ventured deeper into the woods, I felt an eerie silence blanketing the area. The occasional distant rustling of leaves kept me company during my search. Though there seemed to be nothing out of place in these woods initially, however, as I moved further in, things started getting strange. About half a mile into my excursion, I stumbled upon something that stopped me in my tracks. In front of me was what appeared to be an old boot lying in complete disarray torn apart by what seemed animal claws or teeth marks. It was then that I noticed claw marks etched into the surrounding trees accompanied by thick dark red streaks originating from nearby bushes that resembled trails of blood. The gruesome sight hit me like a punch to my gut. With my heart racing and my hand trembling, I followed the trail. Minutes felt like hours as I slowly navigated the terrain until the trail ended abruptly at a small clearing near an abandoned mine entrance. Inside this clearing stood what was once a magnificent deer, now mutilated and hanging by chains from a tree. My stomach churned at the sight, but there was something even more unnerving. Standing beneath the deer was a creature unlike any I had ever seen before. It stood tall and hulking, with elongated limbs and distorted facial features resembling a human's. Its skin appeared to be rotting or burnt in various places, with patches missing altogether revealing sinewy muscles covered in dried blood. The creature sensed me before I could do anything to hide my presence. Its head snapped in my direction, locking eyes with mine. My mind was screaming for me to run, but my legs betrayed me, rooted to the spot. The beast snarled savagely, bearing an unnaturally wide maw full of jagged teeth. In that moment I knew what had attacked Tobin must have been this terrifying entity. I forced myself to remember my training, trying to remain calm despite every fiber of my being urging me to panic. My first thoughts of calling for help vanished when I recognized that doing so might make the monster more aggressive. Ripping the dangling walkie-talkie off my shoulder while maintaining eye contact with the insidious behemoth, I whispered desperately for backup before tossing it into the thick underbrush nearby, hoping it would buy me some time as it lost interest in the static chatter emitting from its new resting place. As the static crackled from the walkie-talkie, the creature turned its attention to the sound, giving me a chance to slip away. My heart pounded in my chest as I moved as quietly as possible, desperately hoping not to attract its notice again. I retreated back along the trail, relying on muscle memory since I couldn't take my eyes off the monstrous being in the distance. It seemed preoccupied with the walkie-talkie for now, but I knew that could change in an instant. When I was far enough away, I dared to break into a run. I needed to get back to civilization and warn people about this nightmarish entity. As I sped through the brush— Trying not to trip over roots or branches, I heard a guttural howl coming from behind me. My breath caught in my throat as I realized that the creature had given up its pursuit of the walkie-talkie and was now after me again. The howling grew louder, and it was only a matter of time before it caught up with me. Knowing that running wasn't going to save me, I took one desperate measure, climbing a tree. Despite my shaking limbs and fear-induced clumsiness, I managed to scale one of the taller trees nearby and hid among its leaves and branches. Moments later, the beast appeared below me. It sniffed around like a predator searching for prey, saliva dripping from its gaping maw. As it pawed at the base of my tree with those abhorrent claws, I began to question whether hiding in a tree had been wise. I could no longer call for help. My walkie-talkie lay discarded somewhere in the woods where that vile thing had been engrossed by it. Waiting was all that I could do as my muscles tensed every time it made an attempt to climb or reach for me but failed. 
Hours passed while the creature beneath growled in frustration, and the sun began to set. Shadows took over the woods, turning them into a dark haven for sinister beings like the ones stalking me. As the last light of day vanished, I heard an approaching group of hikers led by another ranger who had received my whispered call for backup. They carried flashlights that pierced the darkness, and I could tell they were unaware of the creature lurking nearby. I shouted out to them, warning them to stay away and be cautious. My voice seemed to antagonize the creature as it retreated into the shadows, apparently wary of discovery. The search party reached me, and after helping me down from the tree, we began a cautious trek back to safety. Throughout our journey out of the forest, we remained alert to every sound and movement but didn't encounter the creature again. Upon reaching base camp, we reported our experiences to our superiors and urged them to close off that area of the woods until it could be dealt with properly. News spread about Tobin's mauling and my encounter with an unknown creature in the same vicinity. Everyone was on edge in fear that it might attack again. No one knew if it was an escaped experiment or some kind of advanced predator never before seen by humans. Wildlife officials barricaded off sections of the woods while attempting futile searches for the monster. To this day, no one has captured or identified that creature, despite various sightings near the abandoned mine entrance. A somber memory hangs over those woods, a grisly reminder of terror unfathomable. I still work as a ranger but have transferred to a different location free from deadly creatures lurking in dark forests occasional updates reach me about continued hunts for that nightmarish monster that nearly cost me my life. As for Tobin, he survived his ordeal but didn't escape unscathed. He suffered severe injuries that resulted in physical therapy sessions. His tail and mind serve as reminders to my fellow rangers of the dangers hidden within the deepest parts of untamed nature, a lingering fear that drives us to be ever vigilant. My name is Jedediah Finch and the crisp air of Manistee National Forest enveloped me as I moved silently through the dense foliage. I was part of an elite task force specializing in hunting and tracking monsters. My colleagues, Rosalinda Greywood and Lincoln Chamberlain, moved alongside me, carefully scanning the area. We shared a common bond, surviving horrifying experiences that led us to join this team. As a child, I had lived through a violent and mysterious attack on my family's farm. The traumatic night fueled my desire to hunt monsters and protect others from experiencing similar terrors. Our objective this time was to investigate reports of suspicious activity in the forest. Locals had shared stories of missing persons, unexplained sounds, and strange footprints deep within its vastness. The crunching of leaves under our boots was strangely soothing yet methodical as we descended into the depths of the forest. Our voices remained hushed as we whispered observations and instructions, gradually becoming more attentive to every sound and scent. A chilling scream pierced the silence some distance away which alarmed Rosalinda. It came from over there. She pointed cautiously towards the direction of the scream. Skeptical, but unwilling to ignore such chilling evidence, we proceeded in that direction. We soon arrived at our first gruesome scene. Blood covered the forest floor near what appeared to be human remains. Though it was difficult to stomach, we analyzed it carefully with concentrated expressions. I've never seen anything like this, Lincoln said fearfully. The evidence suggested that something had mauled its victim before dragging it deeper into the woods. This grisly mystery propelled us forward as our search intensified. A faint rustling in the nearby brush startled us. 
We readied our weapons systematically when low guttural growl emanated from the darkness just beyond where we stood. An intensely unnerving feeling washed over me as I realized that we were being watched. Rosalinda, attempting to lighten the atmosphere, whispered, Did you hear about the monster that switched careers? He decided to become a doctor. It was great until the doctor realized he was a quack. Although we chuckled quietly at the joke, I could see the trepidation in her eyes. As we resumed our pursuit, I slowly recognized that this creature was unlike any we had encountered before. The more we delved into its home territory, the more apparent it became that it possessed an uncanny understanding of its environment, including a mastery of stealth and cunning that often left us bewildered and struggling to maintain our composure. My senses heightened as I caught whiffs of an indescribable stench that grew more unbearable by the second. Lincoln stifled a gag and Rosalinda covered her mouth with her sleeve. I don't think I'll ever be able to eat barbecue again, she commented ruefully as we continued onwards. After crossing a small creek, we noticed large, animalistic footprints leading further towards a rocky outcropping. The prints were vaguely human but with elongated claws and contorted limbs that sent shivers down my spine. We paused briefly to make notes of these new findings before quietly resuming our advance. The moon seemed to hide behind clouds as darkness encroached upon our surroundings. Armed with our flashlights and primal instincts, we proceeded cautiously into the unknown. The rocky outcropping seemed to serve as some sort of entrance and we paused at the mouth of what appeared to be a cave. Hesitantly, we stepped inside, our flashlights illuminating the jagged walls and damp ground. As we ventured deeper into the shadows, the air grew colder, and the stench became even more nauseating. Soon, we found ourselves standing in a cavernous room, littered with bits of bone and matted fur. Rosalinda gasped as she nearly stumbled over a half-eaten carcass, likely from something that had once been a large animal, perhaps a bear or a deer. Lincoln shook his head as he examined some of the surrounding bones, attempting to determine what kind of creature could have caused such destruction. The tension in the air was palpable as we continued to search for clues about this seemingly mythical creature. I whispered to my companions that we should leave immediately and call for help. However, Lincoln argued that without proper evidence, no one would take us seriously and pointed out that we still didn't know exactly where we were or how to explain our location to others. As we discussed our options, something caught my eye from the corner of the cavern, a shadowy figure lurking just beyond the reach of our flashlights. It was hunched over and grotesquely misshapen, with gnarled limbs ending in razor-sharp claws dripping with thick, dark liquid. Before I could say anything, it let out an unearthly shriek that echoed through the cave, sending us scrambling towards the entrance. The creature lunged after us with shocking speed. Rosalinda tripped just over a rock near the cave's mouth and screamed for help. I tried grabbing her hand but couldn't manage to pull her up before I felt sharp pain on my leg as the creature swiped at me with its claws. I fell backward, temporarily blinded by pain, while Lincoln desperately attempted to help Rosalinda. I looked up just in time to see the creature swoop down and tear into Lincoln's arm with its gnashing teeth. Blood gushed onto the ground as he howled in agony. Rosalinda and I panicked and managed to pull him away from the creature, helping him limp out of the cave. Once we had made it back to the creek, we did our best to tend Lincoln's wounds. His arm was mangled, deep gashes revealing shredded muscle and tissue. We knew that he needed medical attention immediately if he were to survive this ordeal. After catching our breaths for a moment, we decided that staying in the area any longer would be suicide. The creature's relentless pursuit of us meant it was likely still nearby and still hunting us down. With great difficulty, 
We made our way back through the dense forest, following the winding path that had brought us here in the first place. I began noticing cuts and scrapes forming on my skin from brushing against thorny branches. There was no time for caution, though. Our lives depended on putting as much distance as possible between us and that monstrous being. Finally reaching civilization again, a small road that led through the woods, we hailed down a passing car and pleaded for help. As we were rushed to a nearby hospital, we recounted our horrifying tale to skeptical medical staff who struggled to grasp our story's reality. Lincoln underwent emergency surgery for his injuries. Though he survived, they amputated his arm due to severe damage. Rosalinda and I bore wounds of our own, both physical and emotional. However, we counted ourselves lucky simply to be alive. Despite providing vivid descriptions of the creature we encountered, no one could identify its species or origin, not even experienced hunters or zoologists. It remains an enigma within those dark woods, haunting my nightmares and leaving me wondering how close death had come. In the months since the incident, our town has seen a spike in wildlife deaths, mangled carcasses discovered in unnatural states. We may never truly escape the creature that remains lurking in the shadows, those moments etched into our minds serving as a chilling reminder of nature's terrible power and cruelty. I remember the exact moment when everything changed. I was standing with my two friends, Norman Castleberry and Clara Hastingford, in the heart of Yosemite National Park. You know, the place filled with breathtaking waterfalls, endless forests, and vast meadows. I had always heard about the place but never imagined I'd actually be here. We were your typical trio of friends, me being a recently divorced corporate manager trying to let go of the past, Norman, an over-enthusiastic kindergarten teacher who made even the most tedious adventures fun, and Clara, a brilliant scientist with an iron will and determination. The decision to embark on this trip was a unanimous one. We had no clue that it would turn into a living nightmare. The day started innocently enough. We walked through the forest trails, admiring its beauty and snapping photos left and right. Along the way, we joked about our jobs and shared memories from our childhoods like how my mom used to make us try weird and sometimes disgusting concoctions that she called culinary experiments. As evening approached, we spotted what appeared to be smoke in the distance. Guided by curiosity rather than common sense, we decided to investigate. As we got closer, we discovered a gruesome scene campsite wreckage with pools of blood everywhere. This is insane. Norman muttered under his breath as Clara knelt down to take a closer look. There might still be people here who need help, I suggested cautiously. But there were no voices calling for help or any signs of life near that wrecked spot. As dusk settled, we realized leaving would be dangerous since none of us knew how to navigate the park in darkness. Reluctantly, we decided to stay and search for any survivors at first light. We did our best to sleep despite the disturbing discovery myriads away from us. In hindsight, maybe it would have been wiser to fire off a flare and hope park rangers would come, but we were distressed and didn't think that far ahead. At the first glimmer of dawn, Clara started hearing something. It was an odd sound, like a mixture of scraping and clicking. Moments later, a treacherous creature emerged from the shadows. Although we had never seen or heard of this thing before, its grotesque appearance immediately filled us with dread. It was an indescribable combination of animal features think claws, scales, and teeth that could chew through flesh easily. Frozen in fear, we watched as the creature stalked our campsite, 
sniffing the air and carefully surveying its surroundings. Its thick hide shimmered under the fading moonlight, while bulging muscles flexed beneath its scaly exterior. Guys, Norman whispered, voice trembling with fear. Back up slowly and quietly. We inched away from the monstrosity that stood between us and the mangled remains of other unfortunate campers. I pressed my hand against the tree for balance when I accidentally snapped a twig underfoot. The sound of that twig snapping echoed through the otherwise silent woods, drawing the creature's attention. Its head snapped in our direction as its eyes locked onto me. Fearing for my life and those of my friends, I made a split-second decision. Run! I shouted, and we all took off towards the trailhead, desperate to escape. The creature let out a terrifying growl and began to pursue us with an unnatural speed. It was apparent this was not an ordinary animal from any known biology. As we ran, Clara stumbled and fell, letting out a cry of pain. Without much forethought, I stopped to help her up, risking becoming the creature's next victim. Norman and Lila had also halted, unsure of abandoning us or following suit. Go! Get help! I yelled to them as I hoisted Clara onto my shoulder. Despite their hesitation, they reluctantly continued sprinting away from the danger. The creature was closing in on us when it suddenly stopped its pursuit of Norman and Lila and focused on Clara and me. It seemed to understand that we were easy prey, injured and unable to run at full speed. We tried our best to keep moving but the pain in Clara's ankle was unbearable. With every step she took, the anguish on her face grew more evident. The grating sounds from the monster were getting louder and more relentless. Leave me! Clara gasped between breaths as tears flowed from her eyes. But there was no way I would leave her behind at the mercy of this unfathomable beast. No, we'll make it together. I reassured her as more adrenaline pushed me to keep running with her at my side. A loud growl resonated behind us. It felt like it was close enough to feel its breath prickling the hairs on the back of our necks. That's when we saw Norman and Lila re-emerging from the trail ahead of us, running toward the creature. What the hell are you doing? I shouted as their reckless actions quickly registered in my thoughts. In response, they threw rocks and sticks at the creature, effectively diverting its attention away from Clara and me. The creature lunged towards them instead, knocking them both to the ground. Despite his terror, Norman managed to kick it in the face, a daring feat I never would have expected from him, before Lila struggled to her feet and continued throwing debris in an attempt to keep it off of him. Taking advantage of the distraction, I helped Clara limp further away with newfound hope, spurred on by our friend's bravery. We could barely see them now, but their screams were unmistakable. Clara and I reached a clearing where we stumbled upon a group of park rangers. We quickly informed them what was happening on the trail. Although they initially seemed skeptical about our story, our obvious panic and Clara's injuries were enough to convince them that we needed help immediately. Equipped with firearms and radios, they cautiously proceeded toward the scene, warning us to stay put. Time seemed to crawl as Clara and I listened to faint sounds of struggle in the distance. Finally, the eerie silence was interrupted by one of the rangers' voices crackling on their radio confirming they had successfully incapacitated the creature. When it was all over, we were able to reunite with Norman and Lila, both injured but alive at a nearby first aid station. As we all found ourselves safe from immediate danger for now, it gave me momentary relief. However, one pressing question remained, what was that strange creature? None of us dared to speak up about speculations, but our silence carried a mutual understanding. Perhaps this horrifying experience was straight out of an ancient folklore that no one ever imagined could be true. 
the possibility would forever haunt us in the shadows of our minds, serving as a chilling reminder of the night we barely escaped with our lives. I had always considered myself brave, but nothing could have prepared me for my experience in Yosemite National Park. As an experienced wildlife photographer, I pride myself on capturing nature's beauty in diverse environments. My name is Benedict Hollingsworth, and this is my terrifying tale. Upon arriving in Yosemite, I set up my tent at a quiet campsite surrounded by tall trees and the distant sounds of a flowing river. I looked forward to spending the week photographing the park's majestic creatures, as well as relaxing around campfires at night while enjoying esmores. As I unpacked my gear, I met my camp neighbors, Clarice Bingham and her husband, Winston. They joined me that night for some friendly chatter around a warm fire. Initially, everything about this trip seemed like any other, until a scream pierced through the darkness. The eerie sound sent chills down my spine, causing goosebumps to prick at my skin. We all froze for a moment before Winston grabbed a flashlight and announced he would investigate the cry for help. The thought of being left alone in the unknown darkness terrified me, but Clarice urged me to stay with her by the fire. I watched as Winston ventured into the shadows until he disappeared from sight entirely. As minutes turned into hours without any sign of Winston's return or another scream accompanying the eerily calm night air, Clarice grew increasingly unsettled. We decided to gather our courage and search together when we stumbled upon something more bone-chilling than we ever expected. We found remnants of what appeared to be someone's belongings scattered chaotically across the forest floor with evidence of violence all around, blood stains and scratches on trees nearby. This imagery fueled our fear and heightened our senses as we pressed onward. The once tranquil atmosphere had transformed into something sinister and reeking with dread as nature's sounds were overtaken by our thudding hearts, labored breathing, and the crunch of leaves beneath anxious steps. A distant rustle in the underbrush caught our attention, and we veered off the path to face whatever had stalked us from beyond our line of sight. What we saw next would haunt my dreams for many nights to come a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. Its mangled body covered in fur, its eyes reflecting a dark hunger, and its teeth jagged and stained red with blood. I stood frozen in horror as Clarice screamed for Winston one last time before the creature lunged at her with ferocious speed. I ran as fast as possible, leaving behind my camera gear that was once my most prized possession. All that mattered now was survival. I kept running, expecting to hear Clarice's screams turn into desperate pleas for mercy. But they never came. As I crashed through the woods, panic-stricken and utterly lost, I was forced to confront the reality that we had never considered this type of monster's existence. The beast that preyed upon us was an aberration beyond comprehension. In a last-ditch attempt at safety, I scaled a tree and hid among the canopy's dense foliage. I knew deep down calling for help would only draw attention to my vulnerable position, so I waited in silence. As morning light broke through the darkness, shadows shifted around me when the ground beneath the tree began to rustle. The creature prowled below, sniffing at my trail seemingly confused by my disappearance. It grunted and snarled in frustration before slinking back into the forest's shadows to continue its relentless hunt. Clinging to my precarious perch high above the ground, I resolved to outlast this monstrous tormentor as best as I could. Every second seemed an eternity. Every sound in the forest sent me spiraling back into panic. How long could I remain hidden? Would this nightmare ever end? I stayed in the tree for as long as I could, 
my muscles aching from the strain of remaining utterly still. Hours passed without sign of the creature, and though I knew I needed to act, my body refused to move. The thought of setting foot on the ground again filled me with dread. However, hunger and thirst began to set in, and I knew I couldn't stay in that tree forever. As I cautiously descended, I looked around for any signs of danger. Upon reaching the ground, I decided against calling for help. There was no knowing whether the creature would hear me too. Stumbling through the forest, my thoughts drifted to Clarice and Winston. Their absence nod at me. Had they managed to escape? What had become of them? These questions plagued me, though I dared not voice them aloud for fear that would make them real. As night began to fall once again, I found a cave at the base of a hill with enough room for shelter. Weak from exhaustion and with no way to start a fire without risking detection, I curled up in one corner of the cave. In an unexpected stroke of luck, a pair of hikers stumbled upon my hiding place while seeking refuge from an impending storm. Their surprised expressions turned to concern as they assessed my disheveled state. Despite my reluctance to disclose the events that had unfolded in these woods so far, their increasing worry convinced me otherwise. As I recounted the tale of the monster, its jagged teeth stained red with blood, viciously lunging at Clarice, they exchanged uneasy glances. While either outright dismissed my story as ludicrous or fantastical ramblings, it was clear they didn't know what to make of it either. I think we should call for help, one of them insisted after a moment's hesitation. His companion nodded in agreement, subtly ensuring they maintained some distance from me as he pulled out a cell phone. Despite the distant storm and weak signal, we managed to get through to emergency response services. As they coordinated our rescue, I couldn't shake the fear that we were unwittingly leading more people into the monster's lair but help arrived, as promised. A group of forest rangers met us and escorted us out of the woods. The storm itself had driven the creature into hiding, granting us safe passage for the time being. The outside world seemed surreal after spending days in the presence of something utterly terrifying. Once safely away from the forest, I couldn't help but collapse— my body and mind overwhelmed by everything that had transpired. The memory of Clarice and Winston's screams continued to haunt me, and I hope for their sakes that they made it out alive. But as time goes on without so much as a hint about their fates, I can only assume their deaths at the hands of that monstrous aberration are mere chapters in a story that started long before our unfortunate encounter. I still know next to nothing about folklore creatures, but one thought lingers in the back of my mind, Wendigo. I cannot confirm whether it was this legendary beast that preyed upon us in those dark woods or whether it was some other grotesque nightmare made flesh. Regardless of its name or origin, what remains burned into my memory is its feral savagery, its insatiable hunt for prey and how close I came to sharing the same horrific end as those caught in its path. As for me, there is little left but to carry on with my life, changed beyond recognition as it is, grateful for every moment beyond those dark days, and haunted by all that was left behind. I received a text message from my friend Jerome inviting me to look at some spectacular property he recently purchased in the United States, somewhere in the remote, densely forested region of Virginia. His enthusiastic words intrigued me, as he mentioned an abandoned house on the land waiting to be explored. I'm Winston Bartholomew, by the way, a professional photographer always eager for new adventures and sights to capture. After traveling for miles along a rural road, engulfed by towering trees, I finally reached the old residence. You gotta see this! 
Jerome exclaimed upon arrival. Incredible! No one's been here for years! As we approached the dilapidated structure, I couldn't help but smile at his obvious excitement. Walking cautiously into the decaying house with a dim flashlight in hand, we marveled at the forgotten belongings left inside. A busted radio lying on the dusty table, aged books scattered across the hardwood floor, and an eerie family portrait hanging precariously on cracked walls. Jerome seemed to find amusement at every nook and cranny we came across. As we traversed through the depths of the seemingly endless maze of rooms and hallways within this cryptic dwelling, our laughter began to fade when we heard faint but undeniable footsteps above us. Puzzled, we decided to investigate further. We climbed up to find ourselves in a shadowy attic space littered with debris and knickknacks when a loud bang rattled us both. A bracing gust of wind had slammed shut an unkempt window frame. We shared uneasy banter in an attempt to downplay our uneasiness. Jerome whispered nervously, Hey, Winston, don't freak out or anything, but look. His shaky finger pointed towards a dark corner. At first, there was only darkness. But as our eyes adjusted, something distant began taking shape amidst the murkiness. Cautiously inching closer, a horrifying visage began to materialize. A tall and skeletal frame, its limbs grotesquely elongated and twisted like gnarled branches. Staring back at us with deep, hollow eyes framed by a massive deer-like skull adorned with sharpened antlers, we beheld the abomination that stirred amongst the attic's shadows. The malodorous creature hissed menacingly while moving its limbs at unnatural angles. Desperately, we tried to locate any makeshift weapon in the mess of debris surrounding us. Jerome grabbed an old metal pipe while I clutched onto a jagged wooden board. Suddenly the creature charged, lunging towards us with unnatural swiftness. Jerome swung the pipe with all his might, managing to catch one of its spindly limbs and shattering it like glass. The fiend screeched in agony and retreated into the darkness momentarily. Realizing our breakneck window for an escape was closing, we hurriedly stumbled down the attic ladder as the creature resumed its relentless pursuit with bone-chilling guttural growls echoing behind us. My pulse quickened as we practically leaped over furniture and debris in our disorganized retreat to reach a deadbolt door. Though our hearts pounded in terror, out of breath and drenched in sweat, panic gave way to sheer determination. I fumbled hastily in my jacket pocket for my car keys as we resolved to put as much distance between ourselves and this nightmarish entity as possible. Jerome continued at full speed down the hallway barging through a previously undiscovered side exit within this ever-growing entangled labyrinth, while cursing under his breath at our seemingly hopeless situation. Why didn't we just turn back when we heard those footsteps? He muttered behind gritted teeth as we finally burst out into the open air. Our hair stood on edge as an indescribable mixture of fear and adrenaline coursed through us. Fleeing desperately through the woods, we finally reached the reassuring sight of my trusty old SUV glinting in the moonlight. As I started the SUV, Jerome climbed into the passenger seat, his hands gripping the door tightly. The engine roared to life and I backed out as fast as I dared, trying to remain in control on the narrow dirt road. Call the police! I shouted to Jerome, thinking it was high time we alerted someone to our terrifying ordeal. My hands shook as I sped on, trees rushing by in a blur. Jerome grabbed my phone from the cup holder, but worry creased his brow as he looked at the screen. No signal! He yelled over the roaring engine. Our hearts sank with disappointment and fear. The creature, with its ghastly deer-like skull and sharp antlers on its twisted body, continued its relentless pursuit. We could hear its growls growing closer despite the distance we had managed between us. I'm taking us to the nearest town. Maybe someone there can help us. I announced, trying to reassure both myself and Jerome that we would make it out of this alive. 
As we reached a narrow bridge ahead, I slammed my foot down on the gas pedal. As we crossed the bridge, I swerved suddenly and slammed on the brakes. The tires screeched against the pavement as the vehicle skidded to a halt. Glancing in my rearview mirror, I saw that our desperation had paid off at least temporarily. The creature was unable to stop its own momentum and flew off the narrow bridge with a screech of terror, plummeting towards the river below. The momentary triumph lent us some newfound energy. We raced away from that godforsaken place toward any lingering glimpse of civilization as the shadows faded behind us. Upon reaching a remote gas station an hour later, we found ourselves in someone's company at last a grizzled old man working behind the counter who listened intently to every word of our harrowing tale. He informed us that a search party was formed after rumors spread in recent weeks of an unidentifiable creature last seen on the outskirts of the forest's edge. The numerous sightings had even precluded multiple stakeouts, but none had materialized conclusive evidence whatsoever. Authorities remained baffled. Jerome and I offered to aid them in their investigation but were firmly advised against it, given what we endured. Regardless, the authorities were contacted and took statements from both of us, alleviating our earlier frustration of not reaching out to them when we initially wanted to. Though our lives returned to normalcy eventually, we couldn't help but be haunted by our terrifying encounter— even as days turned into weeks. Each time we saw tall trees or a deer cross our path, we cast worried glances at one another but said nothing. Sometimes memories would surface of that terrifying night hunted relentlessly by a grotesque, otherworldly being with antlers like twisted knives ready to gore anyone in its path. In the following months, no new sightings of the mysterious creature were reported. The hunted feeling that plagued Jerome and me gradually waned over time until it became just another story shared among friends and family. To this day, I avoid that desolate cabin and its treacherous woods at all costs never more venturing into the dark recesses of my own past experience. And yet, sometimes, when night falls and shadows creep across the land like elongated limbs— I cannot help but wonder if any other unsuspecting victims have crossed paths with that hellish fiend and whether or not they managed to escape as Jerome and I once did. I woke up feeling an odd sensation that I might not be completely alone. Glancing around... I found myself surrounded by the less-traveled wilderness of Lilydale, a quaint town in the beautiful state of New York. My name is Ezra Stetler, and this was to be my weekend retreat, an escape from the city and a chance to reconnect with nature. Little did I know how unforgettable this trip would become. The first day followed the expected path, setting up camp, hiking through woods, and making a joke or two about being miles away from civilization. The isolation was indeed welcome, and there was comfort in knowing that cell phone signals couldn't find me here. While prepping dinner over an open fire, I heard rustling nearby. Squinting into the fading sunlight filtering through trees, I spotted a few feet away what looked like a deer carcass, twisted unnaturally in the underbrush. Its limbs bent at odd angles and punctures adorned its lifeless body. Disturbed by my find, I mentioned it over the crackling radio to the park ranger station. A friendly voice responded as Lorraine, who reassured me that scavengers were common in these parts. We shared a quick laugh over a joke about how we both preferred staying out of their way. That night, sleep eluded me as unsettling images of the deer returned unbidden. It was then that I first heard the distant crunching of fallen leaves' heavy steps echoing through eerily quiet woods. Dawn offered its tranquil respite but didn't completely settle my nerves. As I explored further into Lily Dale's heart, I encountered numerous strangely distorted animal remains, birds with broken wings splayed beneath tree branches and squirrels mangled near burrow entrances. 
the discoveries painted an unsettling pattern spreading far beyond mere scavenging. A gnawing unease pierced my thoughts but dissipated with each joke shared between Lorraine and myself over the radio. Our interactions gifting a sense of normalcy amid the chilling finds. As twilight approached, I felt a peculiar dread when spying another mangled carcass, this time a wild rabbit twisted in grotesque fashion. Fresh blood stained its fur, instilling urgency in my decision to report the finds to Lorraine. With increasing concern, we discussed hiking out and getting help from local authorities. Night fell heavily as I retraced my steps with flashlight in hand, struggling to navigate the now unfamiliar wilderness. The once welcoming isolation grew menacing with every snap of a twig and unsettling rustle nearby. My pulse quickened upon catching sight of distant shadows moving unnervingly quiet among forested terrain. Huddled by my campfire seeking solace in its warm glow, my radio crackled back to life as Lorraine's disturbed voice shared news of others discovering grotesque animal remains in different locations across the park. Clustered around the fire for protection, we found ourselves discussing our situation when suddenly interrupted by heavy footsteps nearing our camp. Words stuck in our throats as a monstrous creature emerged from the darkness into our firelight, tall and spindly like a warped marionette on elongated limbs. Its head seemed akin to an unholy cross between stag skull and deer head, antlers as sharp and menacing blades surrounding hollow eye sockets that peered directly into our souls. Lunging at us with frightening speed, its antlers clashed together with terrifying intensity. In desperation, I scrambled through my pack for anything resembling a weapon, my hands shaking uncontrollably as they wrapped around my father's old hunting knife, while Lorraine struggled with loading her grandfather's trusty shotgun beside me. As we prepared ourselves, the creature lunged at us again, the force of its attack causing us to scatter in different directions. I managed to keep hold of my father's hunting knife while Lorraine held on to her shotgun. The others in our group were armed with whatever they could find, rocks, sticks, and even a camera tripod. With each step, the creature relentlessly pursued us. Our only hope was to try and buy enough time for someone to call for help. I knew we had limited options as the park was in a remote area with spotty mobile reception. When we reached a spot where a few of us momentarily caught a signal, we dialed for help, struggling to explain the horror we were facing without sounding utterly insane. As the calls connected, we continued running in an attempt to stay ahead of this monstrous being. It picked off some of our group one by one, impaling them on its razor-sharp handlers and leaving their mutilated bodies behind. Their screams echoed through the forest. Eventually, it caught up to Lorraine and me. Adrenaline coursed through our veins as we looked for any advantage we could find against this terrifying villain. Lorraine fired two rounds at the creature's grotesque head before it took notice of her presence. To my horror, it suddenly lunged towards her, antlers raised with murderous intent. Instinctively, I threw myself between them and jabbed my knife into one of its twisted limbs. Though it didn't seem affected by pain, my action bought us a few precious seconds. Lorraine, run! Get help! I yelled out as she hesitated. Take care of yourself! Lorraine responded with fearful determination before fleeing in search of reinforcements. Left alone against such a formidable adversary, I focused on evading its vicious attacks and hoped that help would arrive soon enough praying that Lorraine was successful in her pursuit. As I ran, I realized the creature was leading me towards even more macabre scenes of carnage. It was clear it was both toying with me and showing off its grisly work. I tried to shut out the horrific sights around me and concentrate on staying alive. Exhausted and running on pure resolve, I nearly collapsed when the sound of distant sirens reached my ears. The local authorities, accompanied by park rangers, appeared in the vicinity, quickly surrounding the area. 
Upon their arrival, the creature retreated into the shadows, leaving me bloodied and broken but still alive. Though we had lost friends in this frightening ordeal, Lorraine came back with help, our gamble paying off just enough to keep us alive. The police and ranger investigation yielded little in terms of answers. The creature vanished as quickly as it appeared, leaving behind only a trail of corpses and unanswered questions as to what it was or where it came from. Unable to link anything supernatural with our attacker, it seemed destined to remain an unsolved mystery. In the days following our escape, we mourned those who had fallen, their names etched into our hearts forever. While I recovered from my injuries, Lorraine stayed close, supporting each other through days filled with nightmares. We know that something ancient and terrifying wanders that park now, a shadow amidst the trees waiting for its next unsuspecting prey. But without any explanation of its origin or purpose, we hold on to each other, grateful for our survival against such a merciless beast. Attempting to move on from our brush with death, we remain cautious and fearful as we venture near any wilderness ever again. I found myself deep in the heart of Shenandoah National Park, taking in the lush greenery and calm tranquility of the surrounding forest. I shouldn't have been here alone, but that morning my best friend, Tulsa Whitaker, had slept past our agreed-upon departure time. As someone with a strict sense of schedule, I ventured out on my own to avoid wasting the daylight, planning to rendezvous with him later. My dog, Rutherford, accompanied me, happily sniffing around and occasionally chasing after a squirrel. As a private investigator, I seldom had any time off work. With a unique set of skills in tracking people and understanding criminal behavior thanks to my father being a police officer, my family expected me to follow in his footsteps. But it had never appealed to me as I felt restrained by the bureaucracy of law enforcement. By midday, either Tulsa nor his girlfriend Elvira Fenimore had arrived at our designated meeting spot, Big Meadows. Practically raised together in our small town they did everything as a couple. Even Tulsa and Alvira's first camping trip was planned together. Concerned by their absence and unable to get cell signal, I began retracing my steps back toward the lodge. The once peaceful ambience now felt eerie ominous shadows danced on tree trunks as sunlight filtered through canopies overhead. Rutherford's ears pricked up now and again making me wonder if he heard something unfamiliar hiding behind the leaves. While continuing this search for nearly an hour, the hairs on my neck stood up when we stumbled upon Tulsa's truck parked near the trailhead. It looked abandoned in haste. Rutherford's tail dropped hesitantly as he started growling at what seemed like an empty space before us. Underneath the thick foliage near Tulsa's truck laid parts of a shredded shirt that belonged to him. A cold dread shot through me when dark red blotches stained the scattered fabric pieces, smearing the soil with chilling evidence of violence. My now frantically throbbing heart gave reason to speed up my pursuit. As we forged deeper into the woods, a gruesome sight would have left even the most experienced criminal investigator queasy. Multiple trails of scattered bones and intestines covered the forest floor. Cloth and skin fragments pooled in a heap beside a menacingly deep ravine. A head-splitting realization struck me. Tulsa and Alvira had not been spared this horrific fate. I reached for the pistol tucked into my waistband, gripping it with both hands as I cautiously backed away. This was undoubtedly the work of something far more sinister— something that compelled Rutherford and I to flee before it knew we were even there. In my breathless scramble through the underbrush, I tripped and felt my ankle twist beneath me. As I struggled to stand with Rutherford's help, a deafening roar echoed through the trees. Determined to face whatever stood between us and escape, 
I raised my pistol with shaking fingers just as an indescribable creature emerged from behind the foliage. Standing on its hind legs, this massive beast bore sharp claws and rows upon rows of serrated teeth. Its lithe musculature rippled underneath its thick coat of bristling dark hair as it sniffed the quivering air around us. Wide, bloodshot eyes locked on me as Jewel dripped malevolently from twisted jaws. Unable to shake off a reality where such monsters exist, I squeezed off several shots in quick succession. The bullets seemed only to enrage the creature further, who let out another bone-chilling roar before bounding toward us. Adrenaline surging through my veins like wildfire, I dragged myself up once more with injured ankle crying out in protest, even with dire pain threatening numbed limbs. Escaping became our sole priority. Blindly sprinting towards the direction of the lodge, Rutherford and I burst through heavy brush and undergrowth. Fear coupled with desperation fueled our fragile hope of outrunning whatever sinister force now pursued us relentlessly. Weaving erratically between trees, we could hear snapping branches and guttural growls closing in on our heels. Despite the pain radiating from my injured ankle, Rutherford and I push our bodies to their limits. Survival was our only goal. Finally, the lodge came into view through the dense vegetation. I glanced back and caught a horrifying sight of the relentless creature drawing near. The beast's razor-sharp claws tore through anything in its path, and its fangs glistened with an insatiable hunger. Get inside! I yelled to Rutherford as we reached the entrance to the lodge, shoving him ahead of me. We struggled with the door, finally slamming it shut behind us as the beast lunged for us. The impact of its massive body shook the entire building but held firm. I scanned the wooden walls of the lodge for a means of repelling this monstrous being. My eyes fell upon an iron poker by the fireplace and a box filled with large nails. Quickly grabbing both, I frantically hammered nails into several vulnerable spots around the doorframe. Rutherford helped by moving furniture to brace against any further strikes from our attacker. With no other presence in the lodge, it was evident that we were entirely alone in facing this menace. Calling for help would be futile since rescuers would likely meet with similar monstrous encounters before reaching us. The creature's enraged howls pierced through every inch of the lodge as it attempted to breach our makeshift barrier. In our exhaustion and desperation, Rutherford suggested attempting a seemingly impossible escape route, a narrow window near the backside of the lodge. Anyone attempting to squeeze through would be vulnerable to attack by the limb or those horrific teeth. Nevertheless, we decided it was better than waiting for an agonizing death behind these wooden walls. As Rutherford and I prepared for an escape attempt, we managed to talk about what might have been responsible for the gruesome scenes in the forest, and what we now faced. He mentioned an obscure legend from his childhood, passed on to him by an eccentric aunt, a creature called Wendigo. My ignorance of folklore limited any knowledge of this mythic being, but Rutherford's description matched our attacker in every detail. With Rutherford's help once more, I forced open the narrow window at the rear of the lodge. The snarls and growls outside seemed to intensify as if sensing another escape attempt. As my injured ankle throbbed mercilessly, I gained sudden clarity of our situation. There was no way both of us could make it out alive. Rutherford, I grunted through gritted teeth. I won't be able to make it very far, especially on this ankle. You need to go through first, get out, and find help. Rutherford looked at me with disbelief etched across his face. What about you? he asked, voice full of concern. I'll hold it off as long as I can, I replied firmly. Nodding with determination, Rutherford pushed his body through the narrow passage and tumbled out onto the ground beyond with a groan. Picking himself up as quickly as possible, 
he sprinted toward where he hoped would lead to safety and rescue. I hastily positioned myself at the window opening, gripping the iron poker fiercely in my hands. As Rutherford vanished into the underbrush, I stared back at the creature's hungry eyes piercing through the cracks in our blockade. Time seemed to stretch into forever before one final impact caused reinforced door frame to shudder violently and surrender. The monstrous being clawed its way into sight, a tangled mass of hatred and insatiable hunger for flesh. Braced and trembling with pain and anticipation, I raised my poker and waited for its attack. The last thing Rutherford heard that night was the spine-chilling cacophony of a creature that was no longer hungry, and the sounds of pursuit fading away into the darkness as he desperately searched for help. My final encounter with this nightmarish beast would remain engraved into my brain and mark the beginning of a new chapter in my battle for survival, scarred by an indescribable dread and a reminder that such monsters could walk our earth stalking their prey in shadows both real and imagined. I squinted my eyes, trying to adjust to the sunlight as I licked the remnants of mustard from an overstuffed sandwich. My best friend, Casper Marsh, laughed heartily at one of my jokes making me grin during our lunch break. We worked as park rangers in Yellowstone National Park and today was just like any other day. Casper had joined me at the park a few months ago, a fresh start after his divorce. We'd known each other ever since we were kids. His passion for nature made him an ideal co-worker in this wilderness paradise. Whispers traveled quickly through the small circle of employees about recent hikers gone missing on the same trail. One minute they were there, then poof, vanished without a trace. The park authorities were baffled, but they hadn't found any evidence to warrant closing off the trails. The next day after our routine patrolling duties, Casper and I decided to investigate further. We trekked through a dense segment of the forest surveying its hidden crevices and overgrown pathways that led deeper into the foliage. Hours passed with nothing out of the ordinary catching our eye. An eerie stillness hung in the air as we finally came upon a shallow cave with its entrance partially blocked by rocks. Strange claw marks and torn pieces of clothing littered its interior. One of them resembled Missy Evans's sweater, a hiker reported missing just last week. Curiosity peaked. We squeezed deeper into the darkened cave only to stop dead in our tracks at what lay before us, half-decomposed human limbs strewn about in a grisly display. The sight sent shudders down my spine. Whatever vicious creature lurked here feasted on human flesh. Backing away slowly, we barely managed to avoid the large boulders that crashed down moments later, sealing us inside the gruesome cave chamber. Preoccupied by our current dilemma, we didn't notice the creature advancing from the shadows, its serrated fangs and skin-coated exoskeleton glistening under the subtle moonlight while emitting a guttural sound. The terrifying realization dawned upon us as we stared into the maw of a previously undiscovered creature, the mythological stories of an insatiable beast known as Wendigo might just be true. With no time to call for help, having left our communication devices outside in our haste, we prepared ourselves to confront the monstrous beast. Rusty chains dangled in the corner of the chamber, which Casper hastily ripped off the wall and fashioned into a makeshift whip. I grabbed my pocket knife and prepared myself to face the Wendigo, heart pounding with adrenaline. We circled each other warily, its piercing red eyes locked on me relentlessly reminding me of my vulnerability. The Wendigo lunged, its massive claws determined to rip me apart. I dodged and narrowly avoided being gutted. Casper brought down his chain whip with full force, momentarily dazing our vicious assailant, 
allowing me to slice and create a bleeding gash across its grotesque face. In a desperate attempt to keep the Wendigo at bay, I motioned to Casper to keep attacking as we scrambled towards the blocked entrance, hoping there was another way out. The cave was littered with human remains and debris, making maneuvering difficult and treacherous. Casper continued to furiously whip the creature, but its relentlessness only seemed to intensify. As I searched the area, sweat dripped down my forehead due to both fear and concentration. I spotted a small opening near a pile of rocks which led deeper into the darkness, potentially another way out, our only hope for survival. I shouted at Casper urgently, and he immediately recognized my discovery. We have to do something! Casper yelled over the sounds of the now enraged creature. Its wounds were healing at an uncanny rate as it staggered back and forth before regaining its bearings. With no other choice, we made a break for the opening, leaping over scattered bones. As we squeezed through the tight space, we could hear the Wendigo's growing frustration in its animalistic roars. Our hearts raced as we blindly navigated a series of narrow tunnels leading further into utter darkness. Though not trained spelunkers by any means, our instincts pushed us forward. It was uncharted territory. However, survival outweighed all fears. A small sense of hope arose as we noticed light seeping through various gaps in the rocky walls ahead. Perhaps an escape was imminent. Miraculously, we emerged at what looked like a hidden exit from the cave system and stumbled into the cold night air. We knew distance was our ally against such a creature with limited range beyond its horrifying lair. Terrified that each step we took louder than a jet engine, we ran miles away from that heinous place until exhaustion forced us to stop. Our minds raced through ideas on how to face this unthinkable situation. Who could we turn to for help? and how could we fend off this nameless evil? Wendigo, a myth or not, we witnessed firsthand the undeniable existence of a creature from the darkest nightmares. After catching our breath in the chilly woods, we agreed the best course of action would be to split up. One of us would head back to civilization, find help and gather necessary resources while the other would return to the cave entrance to keep an eye on things. Casper volunteered to venture back, insisting that he'd buy me time so I could get help. Though hesitant, I understood that we had no better plan at hand. Before departing, Casper firmly gripped my forearm as he looked me dead in the eye, conveying a sense of seriousness unbeknownst to either of us prior. Get help fast and come back for me. With that simple yet meaningful exchange, we went our separate ways, I rushed off into the dark forest while Casper stood as a sentinel against whatever terrors might emerge from that forsaken cave. As I arrived in town and made contact with local authorities and academic researchers who specialized in cryptids, animals presumed extinct or imaginary by science, their interests were piqued immediately. They agreed to research further and take appropriate measures under strict secrecy to avoid panic. Casper's sacrifice ensured our tale was heard by those who could execute proper action plans. Yet despite exhaustive searches that spanned weeks and collaborations among numerous specialists and law enforcement personnel scouring our once serene cave site for answers, there was no trace of Casper nor any sign of anti-cryptozoology professionals discovering any tangible proof of the creature's existence. Casper never returned, leaving only chilling memories and questions that may never find their answers. Honoring his bravery will forever be paramount in my heart as I continue seeking truths behind that dreadful night. The relentless pursuit for knowledge has become my mission, enigmatic shadows lingering across the world beg to be explored. I must do so for Casper's sake for the unsung heroes who faced indescribable horrors and perished in the process. The monster may still roam unseen, merely waiting in the dark, 
biding its time. Like the Wendigo legend, these hidden terrors lurk outside of our comfortable realities while our human instincts will always remind us that unknown threats do indeed exist, and we must remain prepared against them whenever they strike again. Amidst the towering pines and the perennial mists of the Cascades, my solitary profession as a fire lookout placed me in a suspended reality. My days were a sequence of monotonous beauty, each sunrise bleeding into the horizon like a fading bruise. The name's Landry, by the way. I won't give you a last name. Folks up here are private by nature. It's part of the appeal. One sultry August evening, with the heat lightning playing tag in the distance, I spotted an anomaly from my vantage. A singular smoke plume snaked its way into the charcoal sky, an aberration in an otherwise clear week. I radioed it into dispatch. They promised to send someone out by dawn. Dallin and Maris were the only souls for miles, a pair of park rangers, whose laughter often filled spaces where conversation was sparse. The next morning, dawn broke but no help came. Radio silence met my repeated calls. Restlessness is not my usual companion, but that day it sat heavily on my shoulders as I decided to investigate myself. The wind guided me through familiar trails until they weren't familiar anymore. Deep within the woods a glint caught my eye the barest sheen of metal through dense thicket, leading me to a scene that defied understanding. Maris and Dallin's cruiser was folded around a tree like some grotesque piece of modern art, metal and bone indistinguishable from each other. But it wasn't the crash that stilled my heart. It was them, or rather what was left, spread in unspeakable patterns through the clearing. In those instants I should have run or screamed or vomited. But I contained substantial fortitude. My pulse did not quicken but slowed, senses heightened for what came next. I wasn't alone. Rasping breaths encircled me, primal and ragged as if torn from unwilling lungs. No beast this sound belonged to, no familiar tread through underbrush followed. Only silence played counterpoint to that ragged breathing. Fear gripped not with icy fingers but burned like those wildfires I was sworn to watch for, a force driven not by supernatural elements, but something far more sinister, reality. Tracking had long been one of my skills. Signs now led me deeper into what felt like another world entirely one where every broken twig could be read like text in an ominous novel. The forest turned maze-like around me, taunting with its twisted roots and sudden drops. Dialogue became internal reasoning spoken aloud to ground myself against impending madness, a litany of facts repeated for sanity's sake. Elevation 2340 meters, stay north-facing. Maris had brown hair, Breadcrumbs of blood marked a trail I hesitated to follow, but follow I did. As dusk approached with violet fingers ready to choke out light, a silhouette emerged against faded sunbeams, a figure unmistakably human yet malformed by intention or incident to something other than natural posture suggested. An intruder amongst ancient trees, this was the creature hounding us all, a man stripped bare of clarity or mercy whose presence alone profaned this sacred place. Shallow breathe betrayed his proximity, a scavenger's whisper urging flight over fight, yet my feet stood planted in grim resolve for reasons unknown even to myself. I moved backward, my gaze locked on the figure. Blood left behind was fresh. Maris, the one who had brown hair, was missing since morning. The figure took a step forward deformities in stark clarity now. It had a man's body but wrong, twisted in ways that defied normal anatomy. One arm dragged along the ground. It was too long, ending in splayed fingers that seemed fused together. 
I spoke one word. Help! Into the radio clipped at my shoulder. No answer came back. Only static. The radio was old and often failed in these parts due to the dense canopy. The figure lunged. I ran. It did not follow for long or so it seemed. Night fell, and with it a silence more ominous than pursuit. By morning I found Maris. She breathed but barely, concealed beneath branches near a dry creek bed. She was alive but her leg was mauled. I tripped over something. She rasped out when I asked her what happened. We made it to civilization by dusk breaking through onto the marked trail as if passing from one realm to another. Maris lived but lost much blood and her walk would never be the same again. The marks on her leg matched no animal any of us knew. In moments of quiet, when watching for wildfires from my tower, I consider whether what chased us was just an animal, or if, by some curse of nature— a man became something else entirely out there where the wild things rule without challenge or pity. This happened to me three years ago in the dense woods of Oregon, a place known for its sprawling forests and rugged terrain. My name is Jedediah Oswald and I worked as a forest ranger, tasked with preventing wildfires and preserving the natural habitat. In our office was a new co-worker named Malachi Ness. He was quiet and introverted, but relatable in his love for nature. While out on one of our inspections, I mentioned a childhood spent hiking with my father. Malachi shared that he was raised by strict parents who forbade outdoor excursions. One day, we received an urgent call about an abandoned campsite within the densely wooded areas of our jurisdiction. There were reports of items strewn about and traces of blood leading into the trees. Malachi and I made our way to the location not knowing what to expect. Upon arrival, it became evident that the scene wasn't a simple case of campers forgetting their stuff. Clothes were ripped apart and blood splatter stained the ground. We followed drops of blood into the forest, taking great care to not miss a single trace lest we lose the trail. The blood led us to a severed human arm lodged between two boulders. It looked like something had chewed it off at the shoulder. I radioed the gruesome discovery back to headquarters, requesting immediate backup. After securing the immediate area, Malachi suggested we continue searching for any other evidence or survivors before the other rangers arrived. With trepidation, we ventured deeper into the forest while trying to keep contact with each other through walkie-talkies. We soon discovered similar scenes, dismantled campsites and more disembodied limbs scattered throughout secluded clearings. As light faded into twilight, our anxiety increased with each passing minute. Something was hunting people in these woods. Hushed whispers populated our walkie-talkies from time to time, unintelligible and unervingly human-sounding. In one of the more secluded areas, we discovered a cave entrance shrouded by thick roots and vines. The guttural growls of an unknown creature echoed from within the dark recesses. We had stumbled upon its lair. Summoning all of our courage, we entered the cave, armed with our flashlights and guns. Stalactites hung menacingly from the ceiling, the oppressive silence deafening as our breaths quickened in anticipation. Within the depths of this lair, littered among carcasses and fresh bones, we found humans in various stages of decomposition, their remains gnawed on by whatever creature had brought them here. The grotesque sights sent bile up my throat. Suddenly, a monstrous beast lunged at us from the shadows. Standing over eight feet tall, it had large claws that dripped with blood. I fired a shot at it before realizing my gun was useless against its thick hide. The creature roared and swiped at us with its powerful limbs. 
Malachi shouted for me to make a run for it as he fended off the beast. I retreated to the mouth of the cave, my heart pounding in my chest. From my vantage point, I watched as Malachi bravely tried to subdue the seemingly unstoppable creature. With every passing second dread coiled within me, he couldn't hold his own for much longer. Any attempt at calling for help was futile. We were too far from civilization and too deep into enemy territory. Our portable radios crackled incessantly with the same haunting whispers. Branches snapped behind me indicating something stealthy darting between trees watching mayhem unfold in its domain. Taking a deep breath, I grabbed a large branch from the ground nearby and braced myself. The creature would come for me eventually, and I had to be ready. As Malachi struggled with the beast, I saw our only chance at survival slipping away. His strength was no match for this monstrous creature, and it was only a matter of time before he fell. Then, out of seemingly nowhere, another figure appeared in a blur. It tackled the beast, trying to pry its claws away from Malachi. It was clear that whoever they were, they also stood no chance against this foe. Despite my desire to escape and call for help, it would do little good. We were far from civilization and the whispers over our radios provided no solace or connection to the outside world. I had to stay and try to help Malachi if I could there was no other option. With all my remaining strength, I swung the branch at the creature's head in an attempt to distract it from its prey. To my surprise it worked. The creature turned its attention toward me, allowing Malachi and the mysterious stranger a brief reprieve. The stranger sprang to his feet, grabbed Malachi's arm, and started pulling him back toward me. Run! he shouted as we stumbled away from the monstrosity that still hungered for our demise. We didn't get too far before tripping over each other due to exhaustion. Our hearts pounded rapidly as we gasped for air drenched in sweat and fear. What? What was that thing? I asked between labored breaths. Frankly speaking, said the stranger as he struggled to catch his breath. I don't have a clue. But we can't waste any more time here either way. But how'd you find us? Malachi managed to ask weakly. The stranger sighed before answering. I followed the trail of bodies. Too late it seems, for them at least. Time wasn't on our side, and we knew we had to move further away from this inexplicable danger. The creature hadn't given up on its hunt, and we could hear branches breaking in the distance. We trudged forward, leaning against trees for support as our desperate flight continued. The air was filled with a palpable fear as the creature's unnerving presence seemed to loom over us at every turn. Our radios crackled again with haunting whispers, sending chills down our spines. However, those whispers gave way to something more defined. Hello? Is anyone out there? My heart soared at the sound of another human voice finally breaking through. Yes. We're being attacked. I exclaimed into the radio, hoping the signal wouldn't fade away. Please help! The voice responded unwaveringly. We've got your location. Don't move. Just hold on. With renewed hope and adrenaline pumping through our veins, we pressed on even faster as we heard the creature's enraged roars get nearer. When rescue arrived from a nearby search and rescue team, we were in worse shape than we thought. Malachi was bleeding profusely with deep gashes on his arms and torso. We both desperately needed medical attention. As we recounted our story to them during the helicopter ride back to civilization, their puzzled expressions mirrored our own confusion about what had transpired in that forsaken forest. The questions regarding that nightmarish creature were never thoroughly answered. Could it have been some unknown species? No matter how many times Malachi and I told our horrifying tale, 
no one could quite believe or catch whatever lurked within the dark recesses of that forest. Lives have been lost to that grisly force. Their sacrifices remain seared into my memory. I've abandoned the path that brought me to that gruesome cavern, but the gut-churning memories of agony and raw fear endure. We had stumbled upon its lair and paid a heavy price. Though we survived, the haunting memory of the creature's blood-stained claws and inevitable return will never fade even as we cling to our final moments. The sun was just beginning to set as I entered the dense, silent forest near Pine Ridge, a small Native American reservation in South Dakota. My name is Akachita Sagwa, and I am an amateur investigator with a thirst for exploring unexplained mysteries. Strolling deeper into the woods, I came across a small gathering of people with dazed expressions. Their faces were smeared with dirt their clothes torn as if they had escaped some unspeakable danger. I approached them cautiously, asking if they needed assistance. They exchanged brief glances before one of them spoke up. We've been searching for our missing friend for days, the man said. We found something else instead. It's been hunting us. As we ventured further into the woods together, they explained how bodies had been turning up in the area over recent weeks, mutilated beyond recognition. Each set of remains had been discovered at different points in time, leading them to believe that whatever was behind this was not a human serial killer but some sort of creature that stalked its prey unrelentingly. We stumbled upon a cabin deep within the forest where faint screams echoed from within. Hesitating for a moment, we decided to investigate as a group. Creeping forward and peering through the front window, we spotted an immense, animalistic creature devouring leftovers from what seemed like a recent kill. Its massive jaw gnashed on flesh and bone with powerful force. The monstrosity had deeply matted fur covering its body and limbs that ended in razor-sharp claws. Upon closer inspection, we could see patches of scales interlaced with the fur giving it an almost serpentine appearance. The sheer size and grotesque features made it clear that this creature was unlike anything any of us had ever encountered or heard of. My blood ran cold as the creature raised its head and locked eyes with me through the window. In that instant, we knew that it was aware of our presence and intended to hunt us down one by one. Panicked, we fled the cabin, each of us scattering in different directions. As I sprinted away from the cabin, I could hear the guttural growls of the creature following close behind. While running through the forest, I tripped over a tree root and slammed to the ground. Too fatigued to get up, I decided to crawl underneath a nearby fallen tree trunk to hide momentarily. I struggled to catch my breath as the scent of decay from the trunk almost suffocated me. As I lay there under the rotting wood, shadows began to move overhead. The creature was getting closer. In terror, I remembered stories from my father about a shape-shifting being he had encountered long ago in another part of the reservation. It stalked and killed people for sport but disappeared when confronted by a group of warriors wielding sacred weapons. As the shadows above me swirled and changed into a swarm of crows that circled my hiding spot, I understood that whatever this monster was, its legend had been passed down from generation to generation without understanding or recognition amongst my people. The nameless creature was relentless in its pursuit, taking different victims every time while remaining hidden within our folklore. I couldn't summon help. No one would believe me if we somehow managed to escape this ordeal alive. But all hope wasn't lost that fateful encounter my father had might provide some hint as to how we could survive against such an adversary. Suddenly, 
I heard my companions outside being picked off one at a time, their cries resonating through the quiet air before silence descended once more. Quietly emerging from my hiding spot, I knew what had to be done before this creature claimed any more lives. I crawled out of my hiding spot, carefully avoiding the swarm of crows that still circled above. My heart pounded as I tried to remember the encounter my father had described to me. He had mentioned a group of warriors wielding sacred weapons who managed to chase off the creature. If only I could find something similar, we might stand a chance. In a desperate search for anything that could help, I spotted a hatchet leaning against a tree stump nearby. The handle was etched with symbols that seemed familiar— like the ones from my father's story. Without hesitation, I grabbed it and held it tightly in my grip. It might not be much, but it was something. I turned and saw the creature approaching, an immense wolf-like beast with matted grayish-black fur covering its muscular body. Its eyes were a sinister blood-red that bore into my soul as it sneered at me through curved fangs stained with blood. I could see in its gaze that it intended to make me its next victim. I wanted to scream and call for help, but there was no one left to call out to. The creature had made sure of that. As the snarling beast lunged at me, I swung the hatchet down with as much force as I could muster. The blade connected with its shoulder, sending it reeling backward and letting out an agonized howl. To my astonishment, it seemed like the hatchet was causing the monster considerable pain. It began inching back towards me, its eyes now filled with fear and uncertainty. Maybe this weapon from the stories really did have an effect on this being. The creature focused its attention back on me as if deciding whether or not to continue its pursuit. It growled lowly before slowly backing away, all while maintaining direct eye contact. It was clear that without more answers or knowledge about what this creature could truly be defeated by, I wasn't going to be able to finish the job. As I watched it slink back into the shadows, I suddenly became aware of voices calling my name in the distance. They sounded like familiar friends who might have escaped the creature's grasp earlier. Feeling a sense of relief knowing others had survived, I quickly hid the hatchet in my waistband and began limping towards the sound, staying vigilant for any signs of the creature returning. It felt like an eternity before I reached my remaining companions. They were bruised, bleeding, and terrified, but they were alive. We didn't know what we were dealing with or how to truly conquer it, but we knew we needed to find help outside of our reservation. Leaving behind our dead comrades, we made our way to the nearest town to find authorities who might listen to our tale. We had hoped they would have another notion of what could defeat this beast, or at least offer some guidance. Unfortunately, despite their best efforts to understand what we had faced, all they had was skepticism and disbelief. No one seemed willing, nor able, to assist us. We left soon after and vowed not only to find answers but also make sure that this story would not be buried with those who perished. This unknown creature shall not remain hidden within folklore anymore. It had taken too many lives under its veil of mystery. We owed that much to our fallen peers Jake, Sarah, and Thompson, whose names and sacrifices would be remembered. With that determination burning inside us, as a unified group, we began searching for knowledge about this monstrous being and weapons that may drive it away once and for all, hoping that our battle against this evil wouldn't end like it did for generations before us. But until then, this creature would remain a lurking reminder of just how terrifying the unknown can truly be. And from now on, Whenever crows circled overhead or shadows turned sinister under a seemingly ordinary day, we'd always remember and know that the concealed horrors within our legends still walked among us.
The darkness surrounded me as I rested by the fire, deep within the dense forest of Pine Ridge Reservation, South Dakota. My name is Niall Keem, and I'm a local guide for tourists wanting to experience our lands firsthand. As the embers crackled and the orange glow illuminated my small camp, I found comfort in recalling stories from my childhood. My grandfather used to tell me about a treacherous creature that struck fear into our people's hearts, a shape-shifting beast with deadly intentions. He'd say that it would stalk its prey, mutilating victims in unspeakable ways before disappearing without a trace. I'd always chalk these tales up to legends devised to keep curious children away from dangerous areas. The years went by and I carried on with these expeditions into the wilderness without so much as a second thought about that old myth. It was the sudden disappearance of my distant cousin, Tallulah Zuni, an expert tracker and respected member of the community, that rekindled these haunting thoughts. She vanished during one of her trips through this very forest. When they found her belongings scattered and torn apart with no sign of her, Fear and despair gripped our people. The first night during this expedition, I dreamt of Tallulah staring at me through the darkness with a look of terror in her eyes. It was enough to jolt me awake. There was silence except for the faint rustling of leaves and the chilly wind. On day two while hiking deeper into the woods, I discovered what seemed like a fresh set of animal tracks unlike anything I'd seen before. The size resembled that of a large bear or mountain lion but with an eerie humanoid twist. In that moment, I couldn't shake off a nagging unease creeping down my spine. Later on in my journey, when setting up camp in a small clearing among towering pines, I thought about Tallulah. As I chopped wood, my fellow travelers, Wanda Onida and Gil Hiawatha, conversed around the fire reminiscing about their youth. Their laughter filled the air with familiarity and camaraderie. In the darkness, we shared stories to pass time before sleep. When it was my turn, I hesitated but then recounted what my grandfather had told me about the elusive creature reputed to stalk these very forests unable to resist injecting a bit of humor. I joked that if we were fortunate, we might capture a glimpse on this very trip. While Wanda and Gil chuckled nervously, the laughter could do little to dispel their growing unease. The next day continued uneventfully until the sun dipped low beneath the horizon. Crouching in front of a newly kindled fire, I suddenly detected movement in the bushes several yards away. Gripping my hunting knife tightly, I scanned our surroundings but saw nothing more than shifting shadows. Feeling on edge, Though trying not to alarm anyone, I decided to keep watch as Wanda and Gil slept. Sitting in solitude as tiny insects hummed throughout the night, my thoughts veered toward the tracks and distant stories of a malevolent presence within these woods. I found myself tracing every sound and shivering at every rustle of leaves. Hours had passed unceremoniously when an ear-splitting shriek shattered the quiet night. Grabbing a shotgun we'd brought along for safety reasons, I roused Wanda and Gil from their sleep in a state of urgency. They blinked away fatigue while searching for answers in my frantic eyes. Now wide awake, all three of us strained our senses into the dark abyss beyond our campsite's glow. There was no mistaking the snapping of branches and ominous growls reverberating through the air. Closer it crept— each step calculated while emitting heavy breaths loaded with menace. We clutched our weapons, ready to defend ourselves against the living embodiment of an ancient fear. Before we knew it, the creature lunged into view, a monstrous fusion of human and animal with razor-sharp claws and a hunger for destruction in its eyes. As it charged towards us, I fired off a shot, and a horrifying screech pierced the air. Out of ammo and realizing the need to act fast, I yelled at Wanda and Gil to grab their belongings and run. As we sprinted through the dense forest, 
I could hear the monstrous creature following us, its guttural growls and heavy footfalls echoing all around. My breasts were labored, and my mind raced to figure out how to save Wanda, Gil, and myself from this horrifying predator. A sudden realization struck me. We had neglected to bring any phones on our trip, reasoning that we needed a break from the electronic trappings of modern life. We were out here, isolated and alone, with no way to call for help. We stumbled upon a clearing with a few large rocks scattered about. I whispered hoarsely to Wanda and Gil, Let's hide behind those rocks and catch our breath. We rushed to crouch behind the boulders, our bodies shaking and hearts pounding. As we hid in silence, I tried to recall any information about the terror that pursued us. While my knowledge of folklore was minimal at best, it didn't matter. The monster clearly existed in reality. Its physical features resembled a warped combination of human and beast, fur-covered limbs bending at unnatural angles and a grotesque snout filled with razor-sharp teeth. The creature moved with terrifying speed and agility despite its size. Minutes passed as we huddled behind the boulders, barely daring to breathe. Just when I thought it might be safe to move again, a sharp screech filled the air. The horrifying creature was close, perhaps even aware of our hiding spot. What do we do now? Gil whispered as quietly as possible. I don't know, I replied, feeling helpless as the grim reality of our situation began to set in. As luck would have it, there was an abandoned hunter's cabin not far from our location. With renewed determination, we kept low and moved towards it as quickly as possible without drawing attention. When we reached the cabin door, half-open door, my heart dropped. It wasn't the safe haven we had hoped for. The foul odor coming from inside indicated that the creature had already visited this place. But we had no other choice. We entered the cabin with extreme caution and found a grisly scene. Torn furniture, broken glass, and claw marks adorned the walls, display of the creature's capacity for violence. If we had any doubts before, it was now crystal clear that this monster would not hesitate to destroy anything, or anyone, in its path. Our best chance for survival was to strategize a way out of this nightmare. Running through the woods like blind mice would only lead to our doom. We huddled together in a corner of the cabin, trying to concoct a plan that didn't end with us as the creature's meal. We have to get to the nearest town, I urged, my voice barely above a whisper. If we can find some locals or even just get our hands on a working phone— we might have a chance. The others nodded grimly in agreement. We knew this was our only hope for survival. Inching back outside, we stayed low and moved in silence toward where we believed civilization must lie. Every rustle in the undergrowth made us jump as we tried not to think too much about what awaited us if we were caught by the creature again. Our painstaking journey through the forest felt like an eternity. Still, finally, our exhaustion and fear were rewarded when we saw lights flickering in the distance, an indication of human presence. Staggering into the town, we desperately sought someone who could help us report what transpired and warn others against venturing into those cursed woods. After recounting our horrifying story to local authorities, despite their skepticism, we discovered that recurring incidents with an unknown vicious creature had plagued their community. They thanked us for bringing attention to their plight and vowed to take action against this terror. Though we had survived and vowed to move on, the thought of anyone else ever crossing paths with that monstrous creature still haunted us. As the town rallied together to hunt down the beast and protect their loved ones, we could only hope they would succeed in eradicating this malevolent force from their lives forever.